Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to story time. We're going to be reading children's stories. Oh, you're in the wrong place. No, I'm, I'm joking. Um, actually, today, we're, this afternoon, we're, we're, we're conducting a workshop on stormwater design. I would like to welcome you all here. This event is sponsored by a number of cities through the Iowa Stormwater Education Program. If cities, you, if you wouldn't mind standing up, it'd be great. The city of Coralville, and we thank them very much for the beautiful library facility. The city of Iowa City, Carol's out there. Has Ben been here? Um, city of Solon, city of West Branch, okay. And then we have the city of North Liberty. All right, uh, University of Iowa, okay. And then I represent the Iowa Stormwater Education Program. You have two speakers today, myself, Pat Sauer. I'm director of this Iowa Stormwater Education Program. And we have Greg Pierce, who is a water resources engineer with RDG Planning and Design. We have an exciting afternoon for you. You all have a CD, which we'll talk about in a, in a little while, a little later, this afternoon that has resources on it. So we're going to get started. I think I applaud all of you for coming today because stormwater management is important and will continue to be important on the water quality side of it and managing for water quality, channel protection, and then also for flood management as well. And we're gonna be focusing on a comprehensive approach to managing stormwater, which may be new to some of you, uh, may not be to others, but it's a relatively new shift in paradigm in terms of stormwater management in the state, let alone the United States, let alone the world. So we'll, we'll talk about that today. So let's get started. Your resource for stormwater management is the... <laughs> well done, Julie. Iowa Stormwater Management Manual in terms of the design of practices and there are also specifications too. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as we get started here. So the Iowa Department of Natural Resources owns and hosts the manual. We do actually have a representative from IDNR and Joe's probably saying, oh, come on, Pat, don't do this to me. But Joe Griffin is here. Um, he's from the central office. He issues the stormwater permits. He's turning around. Come on, Joe, raise your hand. <laughs> Thanks. So DNR hosts the and owns the manual, which is on their website. I've, I've listed the, uh, the website right here. The Iowa Stormwater Education Program, which I direct, works with a technical committee, and we have a number of different representatives on that committee, to update existing design guidelines and specs and to create new design guidelines and specs. And you think that this might be a static or I should say an unchanging, a manual that doesn't change, but the world of stormwater is constantly changing, so we're updating sections. Um, there, there's been research done on all these practices, so there are always advances in the practices, and they're just new practices for us as well. So the technical committee has a two-year plan. We submit that to IDNR. They provide funding to go through the process of, of working with uh, uh, an engineer and other design professionals on working with the committee and creating these either new design guidelines and specs or updating the existing ones. So I think I'm gonna go through that real quickly. So the organization of the manual, for those of you that have not seen it before, essentially you have chapter one, specifications, and all you have to do is Google Iowa Stormwater Management Manual. Chapter two is going to have some general information on stormwater. 2A, 2B, unified sizing criteria, then we get into stormwater, stormwater hydrology. We look at the different types of BMPs, or best management practices, and the applications of those. We get into more specifics on each of the infiltration-based best management practices. Then we looked at, at filtration practices, which, which actually in Iowa are not really used very much, sand filters. I think we're focusing more of our attention on the infiltration practices. And then we get into the practices that manage the larger storm events, the detention, retention practices, the stormwater wetlands. We look at swales, the permeable pavement systems, mechanical systems, and then coagulation and flocculation. So you've got a lot of infor information there. When we started this whole process about eight years ago, you know, we thought this manual was going to be about this big, but this, this manual is, is, has a lot of information, but it's, it's, your, it's your Bible for stormwater management. 
And then there are, there are actually sections on storm sewer design, the design of culverts, open channel flow, stormwater easements, and there is a reference section. The, de the specifications, which are in chapter one, you'll get details. This is really geared more towards the contractor. You get details on payment, measurement, component specification, and then installation of the practices. And so shown here is an example of one. This happens to be on bioretention cells. So you get general information here, and then um, you get information on the products, payment, material, and then execution of the practice, specifics on installation. And uh, just, just showing you the, the aspect of installation, and this is the installation of a bioretention cell. Okay, and looking at the general information that's provided, and I, I invite all of you to really take a look at this part of the manual. Steve Jones from Iowa State University put, he was under contract to put this together, and he sort of wrote it as a book. He was a, a, a lecturer at Iowa State University, so he sort of took that approach to this, so it's kind of written like a textbook, so it's a nice one-stop shop. So you get the background on stormwater, they pr provide in the manual as, as well in this section, information on the water quality associated with stormwater. And so through NERP studies, we have found out that stormwater is not clean. And this is where why we're here today, not just the flood management side of it, but we need to look at stormwater in terms of how are we going to manage that? How are we gonna to treat and remove the pollutants? So there's background information on the permits that are required Developing a stormwater management plan, every, every city, that should be a starting point for every city, is to have a, a stormwater management plan on how you're going to address the management of stormwater in your community, what are you going to your, be your policies and your ordinances as well. We get into looking at the, the alteration of stormwater and what we're doing with stormwater, what happens with stormwater when we detain it and using past detention practices get into some site planning, you get more information on the regulatory requirements starting with the Clean Water Act of 1972, working through the general permits, the city permits, MS4 permits, and then there's a discussion on total maximum daily loads. All of this is tied to watershed scale work and working within watersheds. Then getting into specifics on stormwater management criteria. And this is where I introduced the concept of the unified sizing criteria. This is that comprehensive approach to managing stormwater. Many of you are familiar with detention and retention basins that are designed for overbank and extreme flood protection, but haven't dealt much with the channel protection side of it or managing the water quality side of it. So Greg Pierce is going to get into more details on that. Um, and included in this section as well is a project drainage report which cities and other design professionals can use either when reviewing plans or if you're designing plans for a city or other entity, it provides a nice basis of information. And so I'm just showing you some of the tables that are, that are provided as well. ISWEP has created a similar, similar, similar document to this. And so with that, I am going to stop and Greg is going to take over on the unified sizing criteria. So just give me a couple of minutes. Uh, as Pat mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm Greg Pierce. I'm with RDG in Des Moines. We're a planning and design firm there, and I'm a water resources engineer. I've been working with the uh, technical committee of the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual for, I'm not exactly sure how long now, four or five years, something like that. And uh, as a civil engineer, working on developing chapters of the manual as we update things like the biocell chapter, bioretention, um, I'm going to give you a quick fly through of the unified sizing criteria in about 10 minutes or less. I guess everything you ever wanted to know in 10 minutes or less. And uh, this is, if you need more information on this specific thing, and also we have another webinar that's about a 45 minute webinar that introdu introduces stormwater concepts and kind of the reasoning why we have a unified sizing criteria, like what's going on in our urban stream settings and and uh, what we're seeing with changes in hydrology it really drills into detail on that. There's a webinar series that's available on that that you can contact Pat Sauer on and eventually that'll be available online if it's not so already. So you can kind of download. So this is going to be a quick 10 minute interview uh, overview of this and then we'll go into, we'll drill down into both the uh, 
small storm and the large storm practices. So this will go kind of quick, but again, it's just designed to be a, an introductory overview on this. Now it's moving here and not here. Let's try resume show. All right. So the unified sizing criteria really in the past, uh, you know, I'm not as familiar with the practices in eastern Iowa, but I know in central Iowa, a lot of our focus on stormwater management over the last 20 or 30 years has simply been large storm flood mitigation. You know, looking at that 100-year storm, throttling it down to maybe a five-year release rate or a 10-year release rate or a two-year release rate based on existing conditions. Uh, but what we'll see is, what you'll see is, the rain doesn't typically really fall like that in the state of Iowa. Uh, you see the 100-year storm up here at the top, you know, greater than six inches of depth. If you look at the percent of rainfall that happens in Iowa, a very, very small percentage falls in that class. We definitely need to be concerned about them because they cause quite a bit of damage when they happen, but that's typically not how most of the rainfall in the state falls. Even a five-year storm is a fairly rare event. You know, less than a percent of the rain that falls in Iowa falls in events like that. When we really look down here, at the inch and a quarter event and small storms that are smaller than that, 90% of our rainfall falls in ways like that. So if we're not designing practices that look at these type of storms, we're missing a large percentage of the volume of rain that falls in the state. And in essence, because we've been looking at big storms and not the small storms, a lot of the runoff from those small storms is simply passing through our practices and getting into the urban waterways. And that's why we see when it rains an inch and then all of a sudden our urban streams bounce up and down or we get a lot of flush of sediments and pollutants because we haven't been addressing these in the past because we just didn't think about it that much. And if you even step it up to that one year storm level, you know, then we're talking about about 98% of the rainfall that falls in Iowa falls in that, uh, in that category. So we've been focused up here on the top, but we're, we're, we haven't been doing much about down below. And that results in a runoff pattern you see here, where this is the depth of runoff in inches. And in a one-year storm event, in the, our prairie grass conditions, we probably would have only seen about 4% of that converted in direct runoff. Everything else would have just soaked into the ground and gotten to our streams as groundwater. But now, probably in our urban settings, um, we're about 36%. So obviously, we're delivering about eight times the amount of volume of water to our, stream, to our streams in that small reoccurring storm. And the proportions are a little bit better, but obviously the volumes are worse up for the 100 year storm. We would have seen about 32% in the native settings because even if it rains six inches, native grass is gonna even shed a lot of water. But you see in the urban setting, we're talking about 67%. So about a doubling in storm water volume in that setting from the one year to the 100 year flow. And these proportions get even more dramatic when you start adding in considerations like time of concentration and the fact that all the water is gonna end up at the outlet point at the same time. These bounces and the increases now, instead of being eightfold, they're more like 50 fold in some settings. So that's why we're concerned, especially about these small storms because they tend to really batter the small stream. So we're seeing increases in volume and peak rate. You know, the most dramatic changes are happening during smaller storms, but certainly the bigger storms are a concern to us too. And that leads to the development of the unified sizing criteria, which is this basically four-tiered system where we look at a water quality standard where 90% of our rainfall is that inch and a quarter or less, so that's one standard. Then we have the channel protection standard, which addresses that one-year storm event. And then we look at overbank flood protection, which is tech, usually about that five or 10-year storm event. And then storms larger than that fall in this extreme flood protection category. And as we get on here this afternoon, I'm gonna expand on these quite a bit. So I'm just gonna go through these real quickly, uh, this first portion. And again, these are the different, uh, different depths of rainfall we're talking about. And the important thing to know is the rainfall that falls in each category differs depending on where you are in the state. Um, a lot of the information I have in these slides was prepared in central Iowa, so there's central Iowa rainfall rates, but know that in, in the SUDAS manual, there's actually new rainfall rates that have been updated with the, the NOAA Atlas 14 data. So go to refer to those. If you're operating in eastern Iowa, look at the region for eastern Iowa and use those rainfall rates. But you can see the ranges of those rainfall rates um, across the state. You know, for a one-year uh, event, you're talking about two and a half to two and three quarters inch of rain. 
we get up to that 100 year event now we're talking upwards of seven to eight inches of rain so that's changed a little bit those especially the 100 year values used to be just under seven inches in most of the state before and now they're up over seven inches so just be aware of that and did, i always have trouble conveying exactly what does this mean well you're you know kind of going from smallest to biggest as far as your water quality volume where we're trying to capture and treat that the channel protection to protect our streams, we're gonna slowly release that. We're talking extended tension. And then um, these larger storms, the big difference is we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, the importance of releasing that at a rate that would have been similar to pre-settlement, um, the meadow in good condition and the reasons for that. And this is just another way of looking at that same information. You've got the uh, You've got that water quality volume that's generally going to be your base flow. The channel protection volume, we're trying to simulate what would be a natural base flow after a storm event, so a slow rise and a slow decline. And then our larger storm events, we're trying to you know, keep the channel, the water in the stream in most cases, and then also make sure that it's staying in our floodway, our flood zone, I should say, for the larger events. And a lot of this information I'm going to skip through, but, but I'm going to cover it in the next section. So this is part of a longer, a longer presentation, but there are formulas that are used to derive the water quality volume, and I'm going to go through some examples of those in a few minutes. And different ways to calculate the peak rates. And one thing I like to do is I try to make things simple if I can. I mean, honestly, this isn't rocket science. It's, it's a new thing to a lot of us, but it's really not that complicated if we take the time to kind of work through it. But we can develop a series of simple tables for a lot of this information that allow us to do quick reference and do quick calculations to determine, okay, what size of practice do I need uh, to do these things? And again, I'll walk through that in a few minutes. So the, we get through the water quality volume, the channel protection storage volume against that one year flow. And we're, we're, we're doing that to pre prevent this, that scour we see in a lot of our urban streams where it's scouring the bank. A lot of times you can see live roots that are growing well, they're not growing into air. They were in the ground just recently, and they've been, the ground's been scoured away from them. So since they're live roots, you can tell this is a recent erosion. We'd like to see less of this and kind of more of this, the stable channel system. And if we do that channel protection volume extended detention, we're hopeful that we'll see more of this. And I'll walk through these calculations later. But we still need to pay attention to the big storms because we do have them. You know, we're not going to ignore them. Um, I, I like looking at the Iowa, U, Iowa State uh, rainfall data and seeing what's happened across the state. And I just went through and made notes where there were rainfall events that were near six or seven inches and more. And you know, some communities didn't have any. Like I know Ankeny, the, their largest rainfall rate in the last 60 years was five inches. But then um, you've got Decora that had had three different events that were like that. And I never really understood what's going on with Guthrie Center. But they've had like, I think six or seven events. Um, one of them, they had, a, they had a long range of rainfall data. They went clear back to 1895 that they had rainfall data and they had one back then. Um, but so it's really random. We don't know where these big storms are gonna happen. Um, of course, Dubuque you know, had what, 15 inches of rain here just a few years ago over about a six or seven hour period in the night. So these big storms do happen and we just need to consider that in our design. And that's the quick flyover of unified sizing criteria. Um, the next segment that I'm going to get into while Pat gets it set up is regarding small storm hydrology. So I'm going to talk to the, about the first two tiers on the system, which are the water quality volume standard and the channel protection volume standard. All right. So for the next half hour or so, we're going to talk about small storm hydrology. And this is probably the one that we'll have the most questions on later on, uh, because it's kind of the new thing. Um, and we're really going to be talking about these two lowest portions of the unified sizing criteria. So you've got the water quality volume and the channel protection volume. And again, what we're going to focus on is for this water quality uh, standard, we're looking at trying to capture and treat that runoff. We've got an inch and a quarter of rain that falls on the site. What's going to happen to it? What kind of practice are we going to employ to clean that water and filter it 
before it gets discharged to our stream because by doing this we're going to either treat the first flush of the big storms or we're going to treat the entire volume of those smaller storms that make up 90 percent of our rainfall volume in the state of Iowa. And then the second one, the second tier is this channel protection volume and we'll walk through what it means for extended detention, channel protection by extended detention. We're going to capture that one year storm and we're going to slowly release it from a practice over a period of about 24 to 48, maybe no more than 72 hours. So again, we're capturing the, and treating the runoff from the smaller storms. And if, by doing this, we should capture the largest percentage of the runoff events and the, and the runoff volume from the urban landscape. So we're going to design a BMP that's capable of capturing this first flush volume for the larger events as well. Um, so we're focusing on this concept of the water quality volume. And again, we're basically looking at this bottom part of the distribution chart here the lower, the 90 percent of those small storms. And the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual covers the water quality volume. It's in chapter, section 2B1, it's introduced, but a lot of the detail of how you calculate it is actually in section 2C6, which is small storm hydrology. And the water quality volume is defined as the volume expected to be generated from a given area from the 90th percentile storm event. And in Iowa, we've defined that to be an inch and a quarter of rainfall depth. So if we capture and treat runoff from those events, we're gonna be treating the runoff from the vast majority of storms. So if we do that, not only will we treat the vast majority of the runoff, but it's logical to assume then we're gonna capture the majority of the pollutants as well. And studies have shown that treating this level also uh, usually removes the 80% of the suspended solids, which is kind of one of the baselines of our NPDES requirements for uh, pollution prevention. And uh, how this is calculated, it's the simple method. It was developed by Tom Schuler. And uh, you develop, this has a couple of steps. They're pretty simple, but really, this is where it comes in handy the, to develop that table that I showed. And I'll show it again in a minute. Because it's a very simple equation. Uh, you're simply going to calculate this runoff coefficient, RV, and it's defined that equation there. That's 0.05 plus 0.009, and I is in percent. So, if it's 60% impervious on your site, you're putting 60 in that, not 0 0.60. So, just one thing. That's a, a little slip up that's often done. You know, people think, well, is it a fraction? Is it a percentage? What is it? You know, you're going to put the whole number of the percent in there. So, if it's 60%, you put 60 for the I. And then you take that runoff coefficient and you plug it into the water quality volume equation. So you simply multiply that runoff coefficient by our precipitation depth, which is one and a quarter inches. And then that will give you the depth of watershed inches uh, for the water quality volume. And I'll work through an example of that here in a minute. Um, there's also, if, if for say you need to calculate the peak flow uh, for that same storm event, there's uh, a little adjustment we need to make. Um, and you might have to do this, say, if you were going to de design an offline practice, like you had a big drainage area or a lot of water from a runoff from a parking lot, but you only had room for a small, say, uh, infiltration practice, like a bioretention cell. And you didn't want to overwhelm that practice by having all the water from that site rushing into that cell. You might design a little uh, diversion weir in a manhole that would kick the small storms over there, but then would let the larger storms spill over and bypass the system. Well, in order to do that, you'd need to calculate the peak flow for that event. And this method allows you to do that. And how you do that is there's a little workaround because um, a lot of what I talk about today is going to be based on TR55. And I, is, who, who here is familiar with TR55? Can you raise your hands? Most, maybe about half. OK. TR55 is a, is a it's freeware through the NRCS. Uh, it's been around since the 70s, basically, but it's um, an adapted stormwater uh, program that can be used to calculate runoff in both agricultural and urban areas. And it actually generates hydrographs that you can run then through different practices to determine how the water is actually going to run through the practice. Um, but the one shortfall that they found is for these really small storms, it tends to underestimate runoff. So when you get under two inches of rainfall depth, they actually recommend that you 
alter the curve number, you bump up the curve number to try to adjust for this. So there's where we see this calculation here to calculate a new curve number for your site and it's based on um, a few factors in there. One of them is the precipitation which is going to be one and a quarter inches for the water quality volume and then this QA is simply the water quality volume that we calculated actually in the last slide. So and I'll walk, walk through an example of this in a little bit. But just know that that's kind of there. And this is the procedure and again I'll kind of walk through that. So you'll calculate the curve number for the inch and a quarter storm. Usually you'll calculate your site time of concentration and, uh, and then you actually would input that data into the TR55 software and run it and then it would give you the water quality peak flow rate. Nice thing about a lot of these formulas is you can, especially with the runoff um, volume coefficient and the water quality volume, it's pretty easy to do this in a spreadsheet or to input it into a table for quick reference. I mean here you can see I, I prepared a table where by percent impervious area the runoff volume coefficient is calculated and then on a per acre basis of the site the water quality volume is calculated. So if I had a 10 acre site with 50 percent impervious my runoff coefficient is going to be 0 0.50. This is the amount of water quality volume I need per acre so for a 10 acre site with that impervious I just multiply this value by 10 so I'd have 22,690 cubic feet of water quality volume storage or treatment that I would need for that site. And again, um, in a spreadsheet, it's pretty easy to do that last formula that I showed you so you don't have to do it by paper every time. And this is that adjusted curve number that I could plug into my TR55 program. So for this site, it'd be 93. So, and just to give you a perspective, if we didn't adjust that, that pro number probably would have been in the 80s somewhere. So in, with a larger number in tier 55, it's going to generate more runoff. So that's what you're doing. And uh, we'll go through an example of that here in a little bit. <coughs> Actually, we'll go through an example right now. How about that? Uh, this is the water quality uh, calculation example. So again, let's assume we've got our 10-acre site, 50% pavement, 50% lawn in good condition. And I would like to stress that because uh, one thing we need to highlight is if soils are heavily compacted during the construction project process and those soils aren't restored in some manner by either topsoil replacement or loosening the soils or doing soil quality restoration, which actually is a chapter of the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual that's getting finished up right now, um, that soil is going to shed more water because the soil is more compacted, it's rained. I mean, look at the parking lot islands that we have in a lot of our shopping centers. You know, do we expect that a lot of runoff is actually being absorbed into those tree wells? Well, probably n not in most conditions. So, or, or even, in, even in residential building sites, obviously there's a lot of areas where it get heavily compacted. And we have large runoff, more than what you'd expect in true open space. So just pay attention if you really think that it's lawn in good condition is a good assumption in a case like this. You might have to adjust um, if, that's, if you're not gonna do some of that soil quality restoration. But let's assume that's happened and we're gonna go through the procedure. So we've got our runoff coefficient calculation there, which we told the formula before, 0 0.05 plus 0 0.009 and I in the whole number. So 50%, again, the whole number 50, so that calculates out to be 0 0.50. And we plug that into the next equation here. Oops. The next equation calculates the actual water quality volume in inches. So 0 0.50 times 1.25, so we have 0.625 inches of water quality volume. And in a lot of cases, you're going to need to convert that into cubic feet, because uh, that's in watershed inches. So you're going to have the conversion where we're taking it times 10 acres times 43,560 square feet per acre and dividing by 12 to get inches into feet. And there's our total, which again, was be very similar to the value I said from that table. Then we go through the adjusted curve number calculation and we plug it into the formula. So again, this inch and a quarter is our precipitation and the QA there is simply this value, the 6.25 inches, plugs into there and if you did that calculation, you'd come up with a curve number of 93. So, and for me, I mean, it's pretty simple to, to write this equation into a spreadsheet and you know, break it down by percent impervious so that way I don't have to repeat this calculation every time I'm on a new site. I can just look it up on a chart. 
Um, and then you simply take this value and plug it into TR55 and let's assume that we actually did the calculations and we found out that our time of concentration on this site was 10 minutes and that would spit out a peak flow rate for the inch and a quarter storm of 9.4 CFS. So now I know the volume of water I need to treat and I also know the peak rate of flow that would be heading towards that practice in the inch and a quarter storm. So again, just a couple things to highlight. Your impervious is a whole number. And because we've adjusted the curve number, be, take caution to run this as a separate model. Because we've adjusted this curve number, if you model this inch and a quarter storm with that curve number, but then keep that curve number the same and model your bigger storms, you're going to overestimate the runoff for those big storm events. So you want to do this small storm model, and then probably do a save as and then just adjust the curve number and rerun it for those bigger storms. So just a little caution there um, because one way or the other you could end up off if you don't do that. The next step on the ladder is the channel protection volume and this is not uniform across the state because it varies with rainfall. Um, we're looking at, depending on where you're at, about two and a half to two and three quarter inches of rain. So you look up in the in SUDAS right now, eventually the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual will be updated with that NOAA data as well. But it just hasn't been yet. When that happens, you can look in both manuals to find this. But you look up the region of the area of the state you're in, there's nine separate regions throughout Iowa. You just look it up on a map, you go to the chart, and you pull out the rainfall for a 24-hour storm event for a one-year storm off that chart. And the procedure, again, is covered in that same chapter of the ISWIM, which is 2C6. It's actually in subsection C to cover the channel protection volume. And the goal of this is we're trying to size a practice that captures the runoff from this storm, and we're going to slowly release it over a period of 24 hours. And this is important because of a lot of our practices that we've been doing, they've been, as I mentioned, they've been sized for the big storms. So we tend to have one decent size outlet pipe that manages all the storm events. I mean, it might be a 15-inch pipe or an 18-inch pipe, depending on the size of your site. Maybe smaller sizes, maybe it's six or eight inches. Um, but, you know, if what we've seen is because it's sized to release that bigger storm at a five-year rate, when the smaller storms happen, they really don't get slowed down by that one-size-fits-all outlet very well they're gonna basically pass right through the system and that's why we see this flashy hydrology of our urban streams. There's just nothing slowing down these commonly occurring storms. And you'll see how dramatically different the release rates is using this. Um, and in a lot of cases on a, on a relatively small site, you might have to have a perforated riser or some other type of practice that slowly releases that storm because the calculated size of the, of the orifice that you would need would be too small. I mean, if we get down to two inches or even three inches, you know, a pack of cigarettes, a clump of leaves is going to clog that up. So you may have to have a perforated riser or something else that will manage this uh, runoff volume. So again, we're talking about basically all storms below this blue line. So now we're up to almost 99% of the rainfall that falls in Iowa that falls in this category. And this procedure, um, there's an initial estimation procedure that helps you uh, determine the channel protection volume. Um, then what you'll have to follow up with after you do the estimation procedure, that allows you to kind of know how big your practice you're going to need. Then you can actually cite the practice on your site and design it, and then eventually you'll do a final modeling where once you actually know, okay, here's the contour areas of that practice and how much volume there really is, you can actually do a, a true-to-life modeling then to confirm your initial estimates. And again, this is what we're trying to, to avoid the picture on the left and go to the picture on the right. So this is kind of a step-by-step -step procedure, and I usually tell this joke at least once, so bear with me. But um, we try to break these things down in the Iowa Storm Water Management to kind of walk you through. We're not trying to overwhelm you with, oh my gosh, there's 12 steps in this, I can't handle it. But we're really trying to walk you through, okay, you do this, and you do this, and you do this, so you can understand it, because these things are new. But I like to say that storm water needs a 12-step program, and uh, the first step is always admitting that you have a problem. So, I'm an engineer, not a comedian, too, so sorry about that. Um, but this is the step-by-step the -step procedure for the channel protection volume. 
and uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate the curve number. Now in this setting we're above two inches so you're just going to use your normal curve number. So there's books for, time, for TR55 that have the curve numbers in them. You just look up based on your site conditions. Okay, I've got row crop or okay, I've got this much paving and this much open space. It's going to be a curve number of this. And you look it up and plug it in. You calculate your time of concentration and I'm assuming some of you are familiar with how to do that. There's no differences that, on ways we usually do that and if you're not, there's guidance in the Iowa Storm Water Management Manual on that too. I don't have the time today unfortunately to go through that in great detail. But So once you know your time of concentration and your curve number, you plug those into the uh, TR55 for, formula. You're going to refer to the rainfall data from the uh, um, SUDAS or the Ice Swim Management Manual and now I would recommend using that new data that's in there, that NOAA Atlas 14 data because it is slightly larger. The third step is we're going to determine the unit peak rate of discharge. Um, the fourth step, and I'm going to walk through an example of this in a second so don't think that I'm leaving you hanging going through this too fast. Um, the fourth step is we're going to use this chart to figure out what our release rate is. And we do that by drawing a line up from that unit peak rate of discharge to our 24-hour curve. And then we draw it back over to this, this left column that has the ratio of versus the outflow versus inflow ratio that's allowed for that 24-hour release rate. Um, so then you use that ratio to solve for the allowable release rate. There's another equation that we'll show you that allows you to solve for the amount of detention storage that you're going to need. That's kind of in step six and seven. So then that allows you to do a preliminary site design. You kind of know, okay, I'm going to need this much storage. I'm going to need to reserve this much of my site for that. You can do your site design and then come back in when you have your final grading plan done and actually do a true modeling based on the actual storage that you have and your actual outlet design. So those are kind of steps eight, nine, and ten. So we'll walk through a example problem here. And just for simplicity, I'm going to use the same site parameters. So we've got a 10-acre development that's 50% pavement and 50% lawn in fair condition. And we're going to say that we've got hydraulic groups B soils. And for, for those of you that don't know the soil types, there are basically all soils are grouped into four types. There's A, B, C, and D. And A is the, are the ones that perk the water into the ground the best and D are the ones that really don't absorb much water at all. So if that makes sense. So a, a B soil here is a pretty good soil. It's not the best for infiltration, but it's going to absorb a lot of the water. And we're also going to mention that um, we're going to say that soil quality restoration has been performed under open spaces. So they've either put back good topsoil or they've done some compost amendments or different alternatives to restore the topsoil to good condition. They didn't, didn't, didn't just come in with mass grading, compact it all, and then, and then throw the sod on the ground. Because if we did that, we'd want to up the curve number a bit to account for that. Um, so the first step here is to calculate the NRCS curve number and time of concentration. And there's a table in table two in the ISWIM management manual, which is section 2C5, which deals specifically with tier 55, that you can look those up. And if you look those up, that you'll find out that the curve number for pavement is 98. And that's pretty much consistent across the board, regardless of soil type. I mean. The pavement doesn't care what the soil's under it, as far as its pavement's not going to let much water through. But the curve number for open space does vary with the type of soil you have and the type of condition. If you assume a, an A soil or a D soil, the number is going to be different. If you assume poor versus good, the number is going to be different. So you need to make sure that you're looking up a county soils map and you're making good assumptions about the number you use. But in this case, again, we're, we've figured out that it's a B soil on this site and we've got um, quality open space condition. So I'm going to assume a fair condition for that soil, which is a 69 in this case. If I assumed a poor soil, it would be up in the 70s. If I assumed good, it would be in the lower 60s. But let's just say fair in this example. So. We're going to calculate a weighted curve number, which is basically just an average curve number. So 50% pavement, so 50% 50, 50 times 98 plus 50% times the 69. And that gives us a curve number of 83.5, or we'd round that up to 84. And the time of concentration for this example, let's say that we did the calculations and we assumed that it was 15 minutes. And the second step, you're going to look up your rainfall rate. And for central Iowa, the value was 2.67 inches now. So I'm going to use that in this example. It'd be different again here in eastern Iowa. 
And if we plug those values into the TR55 model, we're going to find that the peak rate of flow was 16.8 CFS for the 10 acre site. And if you do this little equation where you multiply it by that peak discharge by the number of acres and then uh, in a square mile and then divide it by 10 acres, you're going to find out that the peak unit rate of discharge is about 1,000. It's 1,078. So we're going to use that in that chart here in just a second. So again, that's just the peak rate from this part that we got out of our TR55 output. And then you're converting that to figure out the unit rate, peak rate for the per square mile. It's in CFS per square mile is the units there. And again, so if you go over here, that actually just falls off the edge of the chart. But you can see that the curve is pretty flat through there. So if we go up to that 24 hour curve, and project it back, we're going to find our ratio is 0 0.02. So basically what this is telling us is whatever the inflow to this basin is, our allowable outflow is basically 2% of that. So we're talking about very small runoff. And that makes some sense. We're looking for a 24-hour drawdown time. You know, we get this big pulse of a storm that's two and a half inches of rain, and then it's going to slowly draw that down over a 24 to 48-hour period. So we simply take that ratio times our peak rate of inflow, so we find our peak allowable outflow rate is 0.33 CFS, so a pretty small outflow rate. Once we have that, uh, those pieces of information, we can move on to step six, which is allowing us to figure out the, this, um, it's a way to estimate the storage you're going to need to maintain that release rate. And uh, we find this ratio with this formula, and it looks a little complicated, but it's not as bad as it looks. You've got the, the volume of storage required versus over the volume of runoff is going to equal this equation. And you see right there. And again, this is in the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual. So when it disappears from my screen, you're not left hanging. You can look it up. Um, but basically, you've got a, this, that ratio that we calculated earlier off the chart, that 0.02 goes where it says outflow over inflow. So you just plug that into those equations. See one is, there's, it's, it's subtracting this value, then it's adding this one times, square, times the square of that ratio and subtracting this value times the cube of that ratio. That's how that equation works. And when you do the math, the volume of storage over the volume of runoff equals 0.6555. So what this is telling us is, the volume of storage we're going to need to detain, provide extended detention for this one year storm is about 65% of the actual rainfall runoff that's generated. So this is allowing us to estimate the storage we need. So from TR55, it will give you the volume of runoff. So in this case, from our output, it would, it would tell us that 45,400 cubic feet was the runoff from this storm event. So you simply take that volume of runoff times the ratio and we find out that we need 29,700 cubic feet of storage to provide extended detention for the one-year event. And, you know, I always like to kind of, you know, double check the whole garbage in, garbage out side of calculations. I mean, does this answer make sense? Well, we just calculated that our water quality volume, which was like an inch and a quarter, that we need 22,700 for that for a similar site. So this is a bit more than that okay, it seems like we might have a good proportion. And remember the water quality volume, we're relying on that percolating through a, a practice so it doesn't have direct discharge like this would. So it seems like it makes some sense. If the number was smaller than the water quality volume, I'd be concerned. Or dramatically, like three or four times the size, you might want to go back and check your math. So steps through ten, eight through 10 then will require more detailed design. Uh, so once you have that initial estimate, this allows you to go and develop a grading plan or a site design knowing, oh, I need this much storage. So if I'm going to have, say, and a lot of times I used to like, like, like to make a rule of thumb where I'd like that water in that one year storm to only get maybe a foot or two feet deep. Because what you don't want is when we get two inches of rain to have a basin that's got eight feet of water in it and it's going to take 48 hours to drain down. That's not probably the way you want to go. I usually try to, you want to keep that bounce kind of steady. So I start with maybe a, a one, one and a half, two foot of bounce. You may go up a little bit more than that, but you know, so you, you look there and say, well, you know, if I, if I have a foot of bounce for that amount, you know, I might be talking, 
you know, three quarters of an acre of, of an area. Or if I've got two feet, well, maybe you're talking more like a half an acre of size. Um, so that allows you to kind of cite that on your, on, program that on your site, you know, and do the remainder of your site design, develop a real grading plan for that, and come back and do your detailed modeling. So when you have that and you know, okay, well, I've got that amount of storage, you know, what size of outlet do I need? And that's what step eight is. You can size the control outlet with this equation if you're doing with an orifice there. So you've got the area of the, of the outlet, and this is just your orifice equation there, and this is your outflow rate divided the, by the head over the, the orifice, the elevation surface over the orifice. And one little cautionary point there that I see messed up sometimes is, especially if you're dealing with an outlet that's vertical, that elevation, H, is measured from the water surface, the high water surface, to the center of your outlet pipe. Some people measure it to the bottom, but it's actually to the center. I mean, if it's, if it's oriented like this, it would be at the bottom, but if it's a, like a pipe like this, it's to the center of the outlet area. So just kind of know that, because sometimes that gets messed up. And then um, step nine allows you, once you know the area you have, you can calculate the diameter of a pipe if, if, if that works for you. And then step 10 is the actual reservoir routing. So you know, once you know the size of the pipe, most most of us probably use some actual modeling software now to do this. I mean, TR55 is a nice program, but it doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles. So there's a lot of third-party software out there like Hydroflow or HydroCAD or things like that that allow you to put more detailed design of your detention in there. And you can simply say, okay, I calculated, I need a four-inch orifice for this practice and put that in with the elevations and things like that and have it do your modeling for you. So that's one, uh, one method. There's also another method if, if, if a, a good check method that this is from Wisconsin, this is actually not in the stormwater management manual, but if you're looking for a secondary confirmation, uh, they kind of recommend it, okay, you know, and they show this for a water quality volume calc, but assume that this, you're gonna do this for channel protection instead. To do that 24 hour drawdown or whatever your drawdown time is, you wanna make sure that about half of your volume doesn't leave the basin before a third of the drawdown time has passed. So for this example, if we wanted a 24 hour drawdown time, you'd want to make sure that that basin was, for that one year storage was at least half full when eight hours has elapsed. So if you, you know, map this out with the drawdown curve from, your, from one of your programs that shows you the elevation in that basin, it should still be about half full. And so if, the, if the, this line falls on this side of the curve, you need to redesign your base and you need to tweak it a little bit. But if it's on this side of the curve, then you're okay. So that's just one other way of looking at it. And, and eventually what, what we're really trying to get to, and this is kind of where the rubber meets the road in my opinion, um, this is a graph that would show you if we did things, and, and I don't know what it's been like in eastern Iowa, but in central Iowa, I know traditionally we've used the rational method a lot for stormwater detention design over the last 20 years or so. Um, and you only looked at those big storms, so you kind of tend to get that one size fits all outlet pipe. Well, if I designed the same site using the rational method, the red would be my outflow rate from that basin in a one year storm. So you see the peak rate is about five CFS. Well, we just calculated that it needs to be about 0.33 to have that steady, stable drawdown. So the blue is actually how the basin we just designed would operate. You know, we're managing the same volume of water, but you can imagine what that urban stream is gonna do if this is the wave that hits it versus this wave. And now, you know, on a small site like this, it may not seem like much, but if we start to compound 10 acre sites become 100 acres of development, become 500 acres of development, you can see what could happen in our urban stream quarters. And I apologize, to, due to time today, we don't have a lot of the pictures that I've taken. I've had a chance to walk about 50 miles of urban streams in central Iowa, and there's just some really dramatic erosion going on in our urban areas there. And I'm assuming that it's similar here. And a lot of people just don't realize it's happening. And actually, you put on rubber boots and go walk them because you can't see them from a lot of our trails because the erosion is so significant. So you can kind of get a sense for, okay, this is, this is why a lot of this is happening. And if we do this, we can start to prevent that from happening even more in the future. But what that is gonna result in is we're not gonna have that one size fits all outlet pipe anymore because you have to have a really restrictive outlet 
to manage this one year storm. So we're gonna have multi, more of this multi-stage outlet design. So if we have a practice like a bioretention cell that manages that water quality volume, we calculated that volume, we figure out the footprint of that that we need, and it percolates down into the ground, we may have an underdrain that picks up that runoff after it's gone through the ground. Um, and then above that, at some level, we'll have that channel protection small diameter pipe, or maybe it's a perforated riser like the example I just walked through. So this might actually sit up, up, up off the bottom if we were designing a bioretention cell, or if, it's, if you're designing maybe a dry basin for extended detention, maybe that's on the bottom. But the point is there's a small control for the small storm, and then it steps up. After a foot or two, wherever you're above that one year high water elevation, then you're gonna have another level and it might be a rectangular weir, it could be another pipe. In this example, I showed a V-notch weir. Um, and then above that, we're gonna have different levels that manage those bigger storms because when we have the bigger storms come, we do wanna let more of that water out more rapidly. We don't want the 100 year storm throttled back by this little pipe because the detention would just be enormous. We wanna have that, those larger storms released at a, at a higher rate so then they would spill over the size and go out a larger diameter outlet. So you have different stages designed to manage different storms. So you, you know, basically, it's like, it's like shoe sizes. You got a little shoe for the little kid, bigger shoe for your middle-aged kid, and then dad's got the big shoes. You know, that's what we're kind of look at, looking at doing. And what I've tried to show in this example is it doesn't have to be a very elaborate structure to do this. I mean, this is simply could be basically like an area intake that's modified. You know, and, and certainly a lot of the manufacturers can cast this in place and have it delivered to the site. Um, you know, or cast in place, or you can precast it and have it delivered to the site. So it doesn't have to be a $30,000 outlet structure. This is something that we can kind of modify what we're already doing simply to, to manage these smaller storms. And with that, that's the portion I have for small storm hydrology. I'll return after a bit to talk about the large storm detention practices. Hey, any, are there any questions at all for Greg before we go on? Yeah. I just, um, something you had said about wanting a, like a foot bounce of water rather than eight feet bounce of water. Yes. Um, that's something we've run into with trying to vegetate and keep vegetation going, that having that smaller bounce is actually easier to vegetate and maintain than to have these large bounces and I'm wondering if that's why you keep it at a foot or is there a reason why you don't want to go up eight feet? Yeah, the, the question is about the bounce. Um, uh, for those who might not have heard, the, you know, is there more reasons than just vegetation uh, for maintaining that? That's one of the primary reasons because, I mean, if you think about it, if you have um, vegetation that's inundated by seven or eight feet of water for three days at a time, it's going to be difficult to maintain. It may start to die off. You're going to have a lot of maintenance issues. Um, there's also some safety concerns. Um, you know, if you have water standing in an area that's seven feet deep for two or three days after a rainfall event, you know, there's certainly potential for kids or other people to get into that you wouldn't want into that. Well, if they fell in the water and it's only two feet deep, there's a lot less safety risk in, in that setting. Um, so maintenance and safety are two of the big uh, uh, issues, plus just aesthetics. Um, and and there, there's a lot of reasons. And on top of that, if for some reason you would pair this with, say, an infiltration-based practice, I'd be very concerned about having too much water standing on that because just the weight of the water would compact the soil over time and eventually it would, wouldn't work. So there's a lot of reasons that I'd be very cautious about that. Even, even on something like a wet pond, um, you're going to have a very difficult time maintaining the shorelines around a wet pond if it's flashing up four or five feet after a moderate rainfall event. I mean, if it happens once every hundred years, it's probably going to take it. But if it happens like every year or every other year, you're going to have some maintenance issues. Any other questions? All right. Okay. Thank you. We're going to move on to the infiltration-based practices, and most of these practices, if not all of them, are used to manage the water quality volume. Some could be used for the channel protection volume. And I think from a design professional's point of view, this is an, an opportunity for you to work with a whole new set of best management practices. Um, they can be made to look 
Um, I've seen some in Portland. They've incorporated art into some of them. So you can really use your creative juices um, and really embrace water resources with a lot of these. I've, I've seen a number of design professionals do that. So a um, starting point in this discussion, and a lot of you have seen this before, is the change and alteration in the hydrology of this state over time, not just in urban areas, but in agriculture as, as well. So our historic ecosystem, the prairie ecosystem, we're soaking up water. Um, the, the soils are very functional, high organic matter content. You have the deep roots of the, the prairie vegetation and our hydrology has changed as a result of development, uh, buildings and, and roadways and sidewalks. We have more impervious surface. So what we're trying to do with these green infrastructure practices or low impact development practices, the practices I'm going to talk about, is we're trying to mimic some of the historic hydrology. We're trying to have a functional system that will infiltrate, percolate, cleanse, clean, and, and release. That's sort of what we're looking at trying to do here. So try and mitigating the impervious surface and the runoff that is generated. And there still are a lot of people that do not understand um, in the communities within they live, for the most part, you know, it's the street to tree stream with no treatment in between. Um, I guess, you know, what we're trying to promote is that there be treatment in, in between. Um, I'm, I'm going to emphasize this quite a lot. Um, it's, this is just to remind me to talk about it. Now's a good time to talk about it. If you are involved in the construction of these practices or overseeing, you've, you've designed the practice and you're overseeing the construction, one thing that is imperative is the big C word, which is communication. Um, and what, that me what I'm trying to emphasize here is infiltration practices are put at the end of a construction project when all of the soil has been stabilized. Because what happens if you put a bioretention cell, which we talk about, which is an infiltration-based practice, and all the soils surrounding the drainage area or in, within the drainage area are exposed, highly erodible, what's going to happen to that bioretention cell that you're relying on to have poor space? What's going to happen? It is a trick question. Not really. What's going to happen? It's going to get plugged. And then you're going to have to re redo the uh, amended soils or modified soils in that practice. So that's something that has to be communicated. I saw a situation where um, porous asphalt sidewalk was put in. I was so excited. It was the first time I had seen uh, a porous asphalt surface being installed. I was so excited and whatever. Came back a couple days later. And where did the landscape company put the soil to fill in between the, um, the, the existing sod and the sidewalk? on the porous asphalt. <laughs> so that was a communication issue. So um, these are still relatively new practices. So I wouldn't make any assumptions ever. And you're going to need to communicate with your contractors and your design professional and, and everyone. And in some cases, it might be the city staff. Don't make any assumptions. So um, I'm going to emphasize that now and probably will emphasize it a little later. And so when you leave today and I look at you, you'll say, yes, Pat, I know we have to have the soils protected. Okay. All right. Uh, rain gardens. Your resource for that is going to be the Iowa Rain Garden Design Manual. Rain gardens are not in the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual. The design is not in there. This is a separate manual. It's sort of made designed more for the layperson, but you as design professionals will use it as well, and contractors will use it as well. It is, if you Google Iowa Rain Garden Design Manual, or if you're under the, I'd invite you to visit the Rainscaping Iowa website that's promoting the, these practices statewide, you'll be able to get to the manual there as well. So what is a rain garden? And distinguishing that from other practices, essentially is a shallow depression, as we're seeing, in the soil. And you're relying on soils, intact soils, that will percolate, will start off by infiltrating, but then percolate through the soil profile. You want the water to percolate. And sometimes amendments are used, compost and or sand. They can be planted to native plants. They can be planted to horticultural cultivars. Um, Stella de Aura lilies or Russian sage, whatever, um, or, or natives. 
And um, essentially, they're integrated into the landscape. They're, they're, they're typically placed where you're going to capture rooftop water and or runoff from an impervious surface, always at a low point in the landscape because water flows downhill. And um, so you've got a lot of options there. And you've got a lot of benefits aesthetically and um, wildlife-wise as well. Versus a bioretention cell is a practice, an, an engineered practice that has an engineered subgrade. And in that situation, you really, you're not concerned with whether the soils are going to perk um, beneath the bottom of the bioretention cell. And so again, we're looking at a practice, a depressional feature, and typically rain gardens would put, be put at a much smaller scale application. Bioretention cells would be used maybe in a, in a, for a business or where you're draining runoff off of a larger uh, parking lot, or you may, if it's really large, you'll have to have a number of bioretention cells. But you have a, um, uh, a subsurface features where you have an aggregate layer, you have a subdrain, you have a choker layer, a chip layer, and then you have your, your engineered soil mix, which is a combination of sand, compost, and topsoil. And what we've done on those ratios, and I don't have those memorized, maybe you do, Greg, but we've gone, we've gone really heavy on the sand side of it. Used to be we, we added more compost, and through research, and this is the ever-changing world of stormwater, through research that has been conducted, when you add in a lot of compost, compost has a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus in it. And so we want to be careful that we're not contributing um, to any water quality issues, but the compost also provides a wonderful, um, if you want to call it biological re re reactor within the, the, bio the, the modified soil. So compost is an important feature um, uh, along with the organic matter that's in the soil. Topsoil is important. You want to have some topsoil, and again, you don't want to have clay, something that's heavy in clay, uh, because you want to have these flow through rates. What are the flow through rates in terms of inches per hour? About, an hour. about an inch per hour uh, rate, uh, rate. And so topsoil, you know, nice consistency, high organic matter content as well. The topsoil is useful in terms of heavy metal removal and a number of other pollutant removal, sources of pollutants as well. And you'll have side slopes, is my pointer, oh, there it is. You'll have s side slopes and then you'll ha typically have some sort of pretreatment that might be a um, filter strip, a vegetated filter strip, and then you may have curb cuts so the water actually can get into the practice. And then you need to deal with the larger storm events as well. So you need to have some sort of overflow feature. Shown is our schematics taken directly from the Iowa Stormwater Management manual, manual. So you're seeing a cross section of that. So in the manual, you're going to get information with design considerations, preliminary investigation information, and then you'll get into each of the components, a description on each one, each one of the components in each practice. And then, of course, you go through, there are design examples as well, as Greg has shown you some of them. So it walks you step by step through the entire design process with a calculation exam, example. Um, this is an interesting application up in the, in the Great Lakes area. Um, they decided to plant this with native vegetation. They have a mowed, mowed border, but they, they wanted to have um, they extended the border somewhat, and this happened to be, I'm trying to remember the year, maybe like 2008, and they were having a drought up in this part of the state. And the natives did absolutely, the native plants did wonderful, um, but the, the uh, bluegrass sod died off, went, went dormant um, for the year. So um, this is after a rainfall event, and that water will percolate through the practice. Here's the overflow feature. The, the hose is in here because there were young plants and they were having a dry spell and they were trying to help the plants along. This happens to be in Davenport and Amy Foster has, was involved in, in this project, I believe. I'm not sure if she's in the room right now. Um, but they, they in, installed some bioretention cells, put in some curb cuts. They used this as a traffic calming practice as well, so a two-for-one practice. You get the bioretention cell and stormwater treatment and they also use it for traffic calming. And a nice diagram showing the bioretention cells that they, they installed. This is an installation in the Ankeny area 
where um, they're pulling off street water and um, have vegetated swale area that's using treating, uh, removing the, the sediment prior to being discharged to the bioretention cells, sort of a two-stage event that, that then overflows. Uh, large storm events would, would overflow into the storm sewer system, planting it, and this is a few months after it has been planted. And Cedar Falls, this is probably the first bioretention cell that I'm aware of in this part of the state. Um, this, they decided that they wanted a grass, uh, bluegrass vegetation in this practice. And um, so that, that is an option as well, but you have to think about mowing, and sometimes I get a little concerned about compacting soils. So something to be aware of. The bioswales, this is one of the newer sections in the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual. So a bioswale is unique in that it is treating the water quality volume, but then it is also conveying larger storm events. We have a couple of those practices, one that I'm aware of in Davenport, and there are a few others throughout the state. So you're looking at a subsurface similar to a bioretention cell where you have uh, an aggregate layer, choker layer, you have a subsurface drain, modified soil, but then you'll have, they're used to convey, so you do have some slope in this instance, and you have these check dams um, as you're moving down slope. And then we're into permeable pavement systems. And so the permeable pavement systems we have a number that are available. I talked a little bit about the porous asphalt. The surfaces themselves, is, that is what differs between the permeable pavers versus asphalt and concrete. But the subsurface is very similar, and I'll try and see if I have, I don't think I have a profile. But typically, you're going to have um, an aggregate layer, and for the most part, unless you have high percolation rate soils, you'll have a subsurface drain that would be um, tied to a storm sewer system or in a treatment train to another practice. And um, so you have aggregate and then an, an additional aggregate layer, and then you have your porous surface on top of that. So shown here is the porous asphalt. One of the benefits of the porous asphalt is it is installed similar, it's a, it, similar to the way a regular asphalt is installed. It's the recipe, as you want to call it, is, is different. The adhesives are somewhat different, and they're using a larger aggregate, so it sort of looks like a black tar-covered Rice Krispie bar. So something to think about. There's a subsurface drain. Pervious concrete, and believe it or not, there's porous, I, it, it took me five years to get this straight. There's porous asphalt, pervious concrete, and permeable pavers. So maybe you guys are trying to we'll have a quiz on this at the end of the day. So um, I have it straight in my mind now. So um, pervious concrete, um, similar, the recipe is different. Iowa State University did some research on the recipe, as you want to call it, and I think they pretty much have that, that down now um, in dealing with the colder climates as, as well. Um, that looks like a gray-colored Rice Krispie bar. And so set up similar to the porous asphalt and the others. So you have the permeable surface, and then the, you have the aggregate subgrade and, and the, uh, the subdrain system. This, uh, these practices, or this surface is installed a little more labor intensive. So um, they, they have to use more specialized equipment uh, for the installation of the practice. But we're getting more and more companies that are involved in these projects and are familiar with technology. Permeable pavers, at one point in time, there was only one, I think it was called EcoStone, um, and there's a whole host of different products that are out there now. They're different colors as well. If any of you have been to West Union or Charles City, Charles City has 25 blocks of permeable pavers, West Union 16, their whole downtown area. They even have permeable paver blocks that I've seen that you can delineate the, um, the stalls in parking areas, and you can even delineate, use different colored ones for the handicapped parking as well. So it's really, really advanced. Just even in, in the last two years, it's pretty amazing. So this is that profile I, I, I was showing you, the subsurface aggregate layers, and then your, your porous or permeable surface. An installation within a driveway, and actually within the city of Coralville itself, the uh, uh, Mayor Lundell installed a permeable paver driveway in his driveway. So he is not only, you know, he's, how does he put it? Um, he is walking the talk. 
So, <laughs> and he's going to present on that um, at the Iowa Water Conference this year. So, this is, happens to be an installation that was in Ankeny before and after, and everyone drives by and goes, oh, wow, wow, that's really cool, that's great. So, um, something to think about for, for cities, um, uh, you know, when looking at uh, promoting that. This is West Union before. This is West Union after. They also installed some bioretention cells, so they, they really worked on that stormwater treatment train concept. And Charles City, they had some small bioretention cells. They did some soil quality restoration along the edge here too, where they um, tilled the soils, added compost, topsoil, so any runoff that was occurring was remediated as well off of, of specific areas. There's a grass paved system where you have a uh, modular, plastic modular system of some sort that's run underneath here, and then you can put in soil or an aggregate of some sort and then plant it. This happens to be planted to buffalo grass. So look at that as a concept. concept. You're decreasing the amount of impervious surface. And then there's a gravel paved system, and the only one I'm familiar with is in Fairfield. There may be more of these, but same concept, only you're, using, you're filling the, uh, these spaces with, with gravel. And so an application of this might be used in a parking lot that's used infrequently. This happens to be in a park area. Installation. And then we get into soil quality restoration. Soil quality restoration is a practice, okay, and this is coming from a soil scientist. This practice can be used anywhere. And I think this is a critical practice in the whole bouquet of practices that are, that are out there because it can be used anywhere. And what we're looking at is we've just finished the revised design guideline for this practice and we're putting the final touches on the specifications. So what you're trying to do, we've sort of renamed it too, uh, soil quality management and then there's restoration. On the management side of it is, um, when you're designing things, if there are soils that do not have to be moved, uh, driven over, protect those soils. Protect that soil profile so it remains functional. So delineating that. Number one, protect areas that don't have to be disturbed. Number two is, okay, you're gonna be disturbing the soils. You're gonna be compacting the soils. You're gonna be moving around. You're gonna be stripping off topsoil. You're gonna to be putting it back, blah, 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 is let's restore the functionality of those soils. And there's a nice little flow chart that I put together. And the starting point is the, in this whole flow chart is, will the soil be disturbed? So if it's not going to be disturbed, what we're trying to maintain is eight inches, or recreate eight inches of a functional soil profile. That's what we're trying, trying to do. And there are a number of ways that are achieving that, and you can actually manage the water quality in two points of view. One, by using these methods, you can manage the water quality that's falling on that soil surface. But in some cases, you have additional pore space that you could divert water off of an impervious surface and manage even more water. So two, two points of view there. So um, first, you need to understand what is, what is healthy soil. So we had to try and define that for you. So we're looking at a surface layer or a horizon. And I don't want to give you a lecture on soils right now. Some of you have already heard it. And you're like, oh, no, not, not again, Pat. But um, to create a more of an appreciation for soil, um, there are horizons that are in a soil. If you're looking at road cuts through any construction project, you'll see different colors, different layers. Those are called soil horizons, and they have different characteristics. The soil at the top is typically called the A horizon. It's darker in color, has higher organic matter content. Um, as you move down the soil profile, over time, as, as, water, you know, as soil formed, your clays accumulate in what's called the B horizon. So once you strip off the topsoil and you have these stickier soils, clumpier soils, those are typically B horizon soils that have a higher clay content. So surface layer or A horizon with a depth of at least eight, inch, eight inches meeting these requirements. A horizon has a clay content less than 25% and meets the definition of offsite topsoil and pseudos. It's soil that does not have a bulk density. Anyone know what bulk density means? Are there any soil scientists in the room? It's a, it's a term that soil scientists use. It's, it's a, you could call it, uh, you, you relate it to the amount of compaction in the soil. And so um, I'm used to dealing in a metric system, so I have to get used to the English system. So we're looking at about 
um, something that doesn't exceed 80 pounds per foot cube. So how densely packed are those soil particles? So the more compaction, the more densely compacted they are. They did a really neat study in Ankeny, and I just found, found out about the study about a year ago. It was hiding on me, um, but uh, someone brought it to my attention. But they, uh, I think it was some students and a faculty at Iowa State University, they collected soil cores from several developments, age developments within the community. So starting from the 1940s to the 70s to the 80s to the 90s and, and 2000s. And what they found was that the soils in newer developments were much, much more heavily compacted. And I'm talking about unbelievable compaction. We're up to two, two grams per, per cubic centimeter. Um, and the organic matter content was very, very low, probably about less than 1% in those soils versus soils taken in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, much less compacted, higher organic matter content. Well, what sort of happened in the 80s and 90s? Our development practices changed. We have more heavy, you know, we're stripping off topsoil. We have heavier equipment on those construction sites. So we're seeing, we're seeing that. Um, and that, so that's a nice research project, so. Um, the, oh, this happens to be the reference to SUDAS, the op, off-site topsoil. So on undisturbed sites, there are two methods. Number one is you preserving that existing soil profile. So you want to identify, delineate those areas, and you want to preserve those horizons that I talked about. Don't disturb. Put orange fencing or whatever it takes and protect those soils. You can use those to manage the water quality volume. You could divert water off of an impervious surface into that area to manage the, the water quality volume or the water. So here's an example delineating those soils. Method two is if you happen to have less than eight inches of topsoil, we know from research that has been done on soils that those soils will perk because they have, they will percolate stormwater um, because they have an intact soil profile. They have what are called these macropores that water will continue to move through them and you'll get an adequate percolation rate. So that's your second method, protect those soils, even if there's less than eight inches of topsoil. Then once, once, you're, once you have impacted the soil, you compacted, you moved it around, you've graded it, then we looked at alternative methods, okay? Our goal, reminding you, eight inches of functional soil, healthy soil. So method eight is you have eight inches or more of topsoil, but, it, but it's gonna be compacted. So it's not gonna be stripped, but it's gonna be compacted. So then, what are you gonna to use to try and remediate that compaction? Some sort of tillage, maybe some sort of ripping. What's important here, and here's your goal, to get to a bulk density of about 80 pounds per cubic foot. Um, I'll highlight this here is you never wanna till or rip wet soils. They found out in the agricultural world, if you do that, you will make matters worse just due, due to shearing, shearing of the, the soil surface. Method four, you're gonna be stripping the topsoil off, stockpiling it, and then you're gonna be respreading it. So here is, you had the healthy topsoil, you, you stripped it off, so what we're recommending, and here's some discussion which is not mentioned here is, the whole starting point in this is to have a soil management plan where you're talking about this, we're gonna be protecting these soils, we're gonna be using this type of soil quality restoration in this area and that area, that's your whole starting point in this. But what you will do is you'll till the subsurface soils and then you'll bring in your eight inches of topsoil and I'd probably recommend probably doing a little bit of tilling of that and grading of that. Method five is when you have four to seven inches of topsoil and you wanna get that to that eight inches, so you're gonna use a combination of tillage and then respreading at least four inches of topsoil or a blend of topsoil and compost to get that eight inches of a soil layer. And I'm gonna kinda of go through this a little more rapidly. Here's a, here is actually a reference to uh, topsoil spreading and finish grading that many of you are already familiar with already. Method six is uh, compost amended and blended topsoil. It's applied at, um, as a blanket. So one inch of compost is equivalent to three inches of topsoil. So four inches of topsoil can be achieved through a blend of one inch of topsoil and one inch of compost. So that's, that's pretty amazing. So you may see some, some cost saving there. And then 
Method seven is you're going to create an engineered healthy soil on site where topsoil is absent. So this is where you're going to be, um, you're trying to, your goal is to create this healthy eight inches of soil. So this can be a combination of compost and or sand, and there is guidance on that. So you would spread two inches of, of compost prior to tillage, you get that wonderful organic matter content, and then you may have to amend with sand if you had a heavier clay soil. So you have some nice options there. Here's a table that, that helps you out in terms of the soil texture, sand, silt, and clay, and some suggestions for sand, amending with sand. And method number eight is if you have existing vegetation that's been disturbed, um, I shouldn't say disturbed, they, they use more modern stripping and compaction techniques like your yard, <laughs> your existing yard if you're living in a newer subdivision. Um, aerate your lawn, top dress with a quarter, excuse me, a half to three quarters of an inch of compost, and then seed over the top of that. And you're going to kind of jumpstart the biological activity in that soil and um, adding nutrients to the soil, increasing the soil organic matter too. I use, I actually, I talk the walk or walk the talk, however you want to put it. I, I did this in my yard. I had a, my other yard is getting on to be about 15 or so years old now, um, but um, we had really poor soils. And so we did this in our yard, aerated and um, top dressed with compost. And we actually have grass um, growing in our lawn is less spongy too, so. The technology has advanced on this. We're recommending using deep tine aeration, which I believe in this part of the state, you have access to that type of equipment. It's a little slower coming to central Iowa and western Iowa, so you're getting deeper in that soil profile. The deeper you can go, the better off you are. Native landscaping, go native. So um, we talked about the benefits of natives, the deep roots, and in increasing the soil organic matter content, along with a number of other benefits, carbon sequestration. But um, they're adapted to Iowa, disease resistant, and you could use them in many different settings. You could plant a patch of prairie, you could convert large corporate campuses or parks if you don't want to have to be mowing them, plant them to, to prairie, get that established. Um, you could even use, we have come up with a native um, lower grass seed mix, uh, buffalo grass and blue grama grass. We actually recommend using both of them, buffalo and Blue grama, the buffalo is really slow to take hold and germinate, but and the, the blue grama is a lot quicker in getting germinated, but boy, I tell you, once that buffalo gets established, um, does a really nice, you get some really nice sod and turf. So you can use the native plants in many different settings. And again, what you, what's happening is you're developing these deep roots and you're improving soil quality infiltration of that soil over time. Here's some of the native grasses. Um, the one thing, if you're working with a client on these, is these native grasses are warm season versus our bluegrass are cool season. So the cool season grasses, they turn green right away in spring. When it's hot out, they go dormant unless you water, 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 fertilize, fertilize during the summer, and then they stay green in the, in the fall. Versus the warm season grasses, they take a little bit longer to turn green, to green up, then they're green through the whole season. During the hot spell, they're green. Um, but then they'll go dormant a little sooner than, than the other grasses. So that's something you probably definitely would want to educate a client that, that might use that application. You likely would not mow these quite as often as well. So depending on the application, we have a question. Yeah, what, um, what's your recommended mix then for that percentage-wise? Percentage-wise, um, I'd like to say 50-50 blue grama and um, buffalo. And I really would like to see, I have some experience, I had to see this for myself, so I have some research plots at my office because I wanted to see how soft it was, so I did the barefoot, barefoot test. I wanted to see how it performed under mowing. I wanted to see, it, see how it would perform. I had the crappiest heavy clay soils, and it has done exceptionally well. But I don't have any expertise in the eastern part of the state, so it would be nice if you guys get some plots established and see how it does in this part of the state because there are a number of people asking me about that. Go ahead, Carol. So there are plots, Carol Sweeting with the city of Iowa City. I have to repeat this so they can hear it. Um, there are some, some plots at Eastside Recycling that uh, let staff, contact staff, and they can take you out there or just 
go out there on your own and take a look at it. We have another question. Um, and I have a strip next to a sidewalk that's exposed to salt on a regular basis in the winter, if anyone wants to look at that. Um, someone else in the audience has a strip of buffalo that has been exposed to salt. And, and how is it performing as ter in terms of the salt? Very well, because it goes, uh, because it is warm season, it doesn't, uh, you know, that uh, salt gets uh, dissipated during the spring rain, so it's done well even under salt. So it's performed well under salt. And what I've been told from some people from Minnesota, because there was concern about bioretention cells um, and using native plants, if that might impact them, and they break dormancy later, which the grasses do too, so you get the flush of chlorides through, um, through the system. So we need to get people working with those, um, those grasses a bit more in this part of the state. I know in Nebraska, they have their businesses that are starting, they have buffalo sod because I've seen them at Iowa State University at the turf grass conference. Um, but you know, of course, it's expensive and it, it's kind of slow to move to this part of the state. So, Okay, but we have options and it's, it's really cool. And then we have green roofs, which is really neat. And the first green roof is right here in our backyard in, in Coralville. That in itself has exploded in terms of the options that are available. There is not a design guideline in the Iowa Storm Management right now, but we are nearly finished. So that will be done fairly soon. Give us a couple months. They'll have a design guideline and a spec. And, and the, um, the industry has really responded to this practice, a lot of advances. They borrow a lot from, from what's been done in Europe, and they've used green roofs um, Probably, probably for the past 50 or so years in um, in Europe, so they have a lot more experience with them. But we're we're gaining a lot of experience. So there's everything from the modular systems, and um, it depends on the depth of the media that you're using. Using there's intensive, semi. Ex no wait, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this up. Semi extensive. Intensive, semi. -intensive. Intensive and extensive, depending on the depth of the media. The extensive have a shallower depth of media, the in intensive having a deeper depth of media, the intensive, obviously, you're gonna get structural engineers involved in, in this as well. Um, Cedar Rapids is a nice example of a semi-intensive. They have chairs, they have um, kind of a recreational area, I shouldn't say recreational area, but you can sit on top of their, their green roof and look out over the skyscape and, and, and read. Um, versus other green roofs like the Des Moines Public Library, it's inaccessible to the public. You can kind of see it from, from some, some buildings. But they have modular systems. There's a business in Davenport that raises sedums, rooftop sedums. Um, but that'll have a shallower depth of media to larger systems where you lay down impermeable membranes and they have all these advances in the technology on the, the membranes that are out there and then you put a media on there and you plant different plants. We visited a bunch of green roofs in Iowa. Um, Central College has a really nice green roof. You can plant it to sedums, you can plant it to sedums, and I've seen chives. Um, I've also seen native plants and, and grasses, but not the tall, not the really tall natives, the, the shorter natives. Okay, if you wanna learn more about these practices, we have rainscaping training and we even have some certified rainscapers. If you wanna take the next step, you can become a, a design professional. If you're an engineer, landscape architect, depending on the practice. Um, if it's more of an engineered practice, rain gardens really we don't consider as an engineered practice. Um, that doesn't mean if you're an engineer you can't design them, you can. It's just for the permeable pavement systems, for the larger practices, um, we consider those more engineering. We have certifications for design professionals and those that are contractors or installers. So check that out. We tried to make it easier for you. We, we have recorded webinars and you can go through that, that process. Just find me and, or go to our website. Um, let's see, where are we? Um, and I think with all of this as a design professional, this is what's really important. If you have a client involved in, in these practices, they want these practices or you're promoting these practices to them, it's important that they inspect them and that they be maintained. And so I would suggest that you provide a um, inspection form to them, provide guidance on how to inspect, what to look for. Number two is that you come up with a maintenance plan. These, this, like anything else in the world, anything, wastewater treatment plants, water treatment plants, maintenance is involved. And we're promoting this, 
this new paradigm throughout the state. We want practices that look beautiful, they're functional, um, working well. So with that, I think that's nearing the end of my, uh, well, there's a, another certification program for inspection and maintenance of practices for those of you that might be contractors and might be interested in that. So any questions at all on the infiltration-based practices? They're quiet, they're very quiet. Um, okay, so we're gonna go back to Greg, and Greg is going to focus on the um, managing the water quality volume and looking at flood control. And so just give me a few seconds here and I'll pull up his PowerPoint. Okay, we're gonna get started again. Greg Pierce is going to talk to us about the large storm events, looking at detention practices. So with that, I'll hand the presentation over to Greg. Sorry about that answering for a question. I, I had a, a good question that just kind of came up that reminded me of something else. Um, one thing I've noticed, if, uh, if any of you check soil groups, like if you're looking for soils information, there's a web soil uh, survey that's online where you can go to basically any county in the entire country and you can get soils information. One thing, if you look on that to get your hydraulic soil group, your A's, B's, C's, D's, some of those have changed. Like if you look at the, the ones that are published for the counties that go back in the 90s or the 2000s even, you may see a soil is listed as a B soil. But if you go online, they've changed some of those designations and they may say now some of those soils are C soils. So they would, you'd expect more runoff from them. So you might, you know, check, you know, if you, if you kind of, I know in central Iowa, we used to look at our books and it'd be like 90% of the soils were B soils. So everybody got in the habit of just saying, well, it's a B soil, it's Polk County, everything's a B soil. County almost. But if you look it up now, a lot of them are C's that used to be B's, so the runoff would be higher if you're if you're using that type of a soil to do the calculation. So it's worth kind of noting, I guess. If I could interrupt for a second, there actually is a new app that is out too for soils. So you can I don't know what it is, sorry. <laughs> isn't, isn't that awful? It's so great, we don't it's know so what It's so great, is. I forgot what it was. I'm put on the spot and I can't, can't remember what it's called. You guys are ready to take notes. But there's this really cool app that, that you can pull up any, you can find out what the soil series, web, web soil survey. Yeah, okay. I didn't want to miss, okay, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what it is too. And believe it or not, 2015 is the international world of soils. This is, this is the year of soils. And what's really saddening is it is more than likely that the topsoil requirement that's in general permit number two is gonna be gone away with in the international year of soil. So anyway. Thanks, Pat. And, and if it is web soil survey that the apps part, that actually is the online service too. So that's actually operated through the uh, NRCS that operates and maintains that database. So if you Google uh, soils data or NRCS or web soil survey, that's a good place to find that information. Just don't ask Pat for it because she'll have to Google it too. So anyway, like anything, you can find it all, I guess, with a good web search, huh? All right, so this next part, and this isn't fair, it's telling me I've already been talking for 10 minutes and I know I haven't. So um, this next part, uh, we're gonna be covering larger storm detention practices. So this is something we're probably more familiar with, but how are we gonna tweak it to meet the unified sizing criteria? And the biggest change is uh, the baseline. Um, what we've typically done in the past is said, well, you know, don't increase the runoff from existing conditions, which has usually been considered, hey, it's agriculture. But what we see is, I mean, you can drive out into their agricultural settings and you see some downcutting of streams, you see some erosion. There's a lot of issues still going on in our agricultural areas. So if our streams aren't really stable completely in our agricultural areas, that's probably not the appropriate baseline. Um, we would have seen a lot more stable streams in our pre-settlement uh, situations. And, I think it's really interesting if you go back and look at the old historical survey maps that the original surveyors from the 1800s developed when they came to the state. And when they would cross a major stream, they would measure it with chains. They would find out how wide that stream was. And, and for example, Beaver Creek in Johnston, Iowa, when they walked across it in the mid-1800s, it was 20 feet wide. 
And today, in a por portion of it that it's mainly agricultural, it's 100 feet wide already today as it starts to come into the main part of Johnston. So there's getting some urban influence, but there's obviously some agriculture influence. So that's why when we start talking about well, why pre-settlement rates versus agriculture, that's why we're, we're talking about those as, as releasing at those rates so that we can have a stable stream system. Because we will see some degradation if we still use those agricultural rates. So I'll get into that a little bit more. And again, we're looking at these next two steps on the four-step ladder of the unici unified sizing criteria. So this overbank flood uh, volume, which is usually about that five or 10-year level. So we're talking about upwards of three and a half to four inches of rain. And the extreme flood protection, which is our 100-year storm, or the 1% annual chance storm, which we're talking about 7 to 8 inches of rain in Iowa. So now we are starting to look at these larger storms, which have been more traditionally our focus. But again, they're very rarely occurring. So if our entire stormwater management philosophy surrounds these, we're missing the majority of the game. But they do happen. They obviously cause a lot of damage when they do happen, so we need to pay attention to them. So the design approach is we're controlling the post-development peak discharge at no more than the pre-settlement rates. And again, the rationale for this is the lower order streams were stable during pre-settlement conditions. So by doing this, we're really looking at a spectrum of storm events, going all the way from our inch and a quarter water quality volume all the way up to the 100-year uh, storm. And you can even look you know, in between these events. So you might look at the 10-year, 25-year, and 50-year in, in this spread. It's more of an array of storms for these larger storm events rather than one specific event. So really what we're doing is evaluating the storms up to the 100-year storm on the stormwater management system, and we're trying to protect adjacent property and downstream facilities and uh, manage the impacts of these extreme storms for detention controls or floodplain management. So uh, again, as we start to think about detention design, we're, we're looking at a wide array, and, and the detention might just be one part of what we would call a treatment train of stormwater practices. You might have practices on a site that are designed to handle the water quality storm and the channel protection volume that then drain to another practice that handles the detention. Or perhaps you have a small enough site where you can do them all with one practice. But in any case, the overall stormwater management on the site, we're looking at managing small events and also these larger events. And just a couple of warnings that I, I have. And I have to admit, in, in my years of practice, I have done some of these things. And I was actually taught that some of these things were good ideas. And there are reasons behind why people think they're good ideas, but sometimes the the costs are outweighing the benefits. So um, some things to, uh, to avoid are passive detention systems, low flow flumes, and flow path shorting cutting. I would also recommend, though, using TR55 for design and routing. And our release rates is based on pre-settlement conditions. So some of these, some of these uh, practices they avoid. Um, this is passive detention. And this was, again, taught to me as a really good idea because the water goes into this inlet and then through a pipe into a larger pipe, um, which is set on a pipe that goes this way. And the thinking is, is you put an orifice plate in this structure, and as the water goes in here, if we get too much water, the orifice won't let it out fast enough, and it will actually back out into this area, which is kind of a fine philosophy for large storms. I mean, it keeps this dry and mobile. That was the idea for, behind it. But the problem is, if 98% of our storm events are of the smaller variety, most of the time it's not going to back out of this inlet into this area. So whatever is on this parking lot, whether it's sediment or oils or, or metals, it's going into that outlet in here and out without any kind of filtration or treatment. If the water was here like a curb cut somewhere and then ran through this grass to the outlet, that would be much better for water quality than, than passive detention. Another thing, low flow flumes and uh, just con directly connected impervious areas. Again, this is primarily done for maintenance purposes because everyone doesn't like the, the little wet area here that's difficult to mow. But you can see there's lots of lawn clippings in here and sediment. And w there were some of these that had really nice algae blooms like right in them. Um, and they're not safe, especially when there's algae. Algae on concrete is very, very slippery. I know now. Um, 
anyway, there's, whatever is in this water is going right to the stream. There's nothing to, infilt uh, to filter it. Um, also, storm water, urban stormwater is very high in bacteria. And parents like to let their kids play with boats and things. And we had a, a public meeting one time when we were telling them that how high the bacteria levels were in the system of flumes and why we wanted to change things. And they were like telling us how important it was that the kids could go play in that water. You know, so the disconnect sometimes is just not there that, you know, realize your child can actually get sick from this water. So another reason uh, why I, 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 I don't like flumes anymore. Um, flow path shortcutting. You know, if this is your parking lot and the water goes right towards the outlet, again, there's no way for that water to filter out and, and be treated. If this outlet was further down and it had to run through some grass or some other pretreatment, again, much, much better. And again, you know, the one size fits all sort of outlet conditions is probably a thing of the past if we go to the unified sizing criteria. We really do want you to use multi-stage outlet design for all these reasons. You know, the undergrain that I mentioned before, you know, if we have a bioretention system and that water is filtering through the soil and then going out the underdrain and then the smaller diameter pipe and then the weir for the larger flows and then the higher stages for the big ones and eventually it might be your outlet pipe that is the ultimate restriction that's actually causing that water to be held back during our big storms. And then finally, having a stable and safe emergency spillway somewhere. I mean, we are going to at some point get a storm that is larger than a 100-year flow. And where does that water go? If you don't have a low spot in your berm or your dam that's creating your detention facility, it's going to find the lowest spot and it's going to go there. Now, what's downstream of that? Is it a house? Is it an open drainage way? You know, those are the things you need to figure out. What happens when something happens that's bigger than I planned? How is it going to get safely from here to the next stream down the hill? And I would recommend it not being through right between the side yards of a couple houses that are 10 feet apart. That's not a good idea either. Um, anyway, I'm going to go through a series of practices today and kind of they're going to be similar design examples, but how they could be applied, applied uh, to a setting and they're going to be basically variations on a, a theme. The actual calculations are very similar but the end product is different. So we'll kind of go through this. Dry detention is probably something, the practice for detention that most of us are familiar with. The one thing I'd really like to highlight is dry detention basins, typical traditional design dry detention basins are not a water quality volume practice. You can still use them, but they need to be paired with something else that manages the water quality volume, say a bioretention feature or a bioswale or a green roof or something else. There have to be other practices that manage that. Now, you may be able to incorporate some of those things in the footprint of the basin, provided that, again, there isn't that much water that stands on them, like every storm event. But I'd be cautious about that, but it is something you might be able to do. But the important thing is, if you just do a dry detention basin, that is not water quality volume uh, management. You can adapt the design of those to manage the channel protection volume, however, and have that 24-hour drawdown. Um, I would also, there's a series of, of guidelines in the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual that are outlined here. Um, another thing to highlight is um, it's a good idea to have a forebay or other pretreatment practice where it enters the, the detention facility because you'd like your heavier sediments to settle out there where you can remove them rather than being all over the bottom of the basin. Because um, over time, if you have enough sediment loaded, the bottom of the basin will actually start to build its way up and you start to lose storage that way. If you have set points at your inlets where you can collect that sediment and remove it, um, that will maintain the storage of the basin over time. So here's what typically we would have seen in a layout with the one size single stage outlet. Um, what we would maybe like to do is adapt this just a little bit to have a multi-stage outlet. So we're managing that channel protection volume down here. And then we still have our storage up above for the larger um, storm events. So just kind of adaptations on a theme. You can also have them set up so they have more of a wet bottom kind of portion from time to time. So I'm just going to walk through a design example here of a dry detention basin. And I'm also going to look at, kind of compare and contrast how I was taught, you know, 17 years ago how to do these things and the results that it would give you versus today. So that's something I'm going to cover with this first example. So let's say we have a 20-acre residential development. And one thing I'd like to caution, you'll see 
these little red boxes down here note the following design examples were prepared with older Bulletin 71 rainfall data. That is the rainfall data that currently is in the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual and was just recently updated out of SUDAS. So the calculations, since that's just been so recent, the calculations in these examples use that old rainfall data. So please don't copy my rainfall rates and use them in your calculations because they'll be wrong. Um, but the, the methods are still, are kind of what are important. So I just wanted to highlight that there. But let's say for 20 acre residential development, we've got 18 acres of single family. And let's say that we found out it's got 38% hard surfaces. So we figure out both our rational method curve number, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And we looked up our, our, our sorry, runoff coefficient. Our curve number from tier 55 is 75 there. And let's say the city said, well, we want 10% dedication of parks and open space. So we've got a two acre park. Our pre-settlement conditions are native prairie and for a B soil that has a curve number of 58. Our existing conditions are agriculture. Um, and let's say it's row crop in good condition and it has a curve number of 72. We've got our, our B soils. And note that if we have mass grading and we do not do um, stormwater quality restoration, that again will move up our development curve number because of poor soil. So just something to be of note. Pat covered that pretty well. And then we calculate our time of concentrations and um, let's say the prairie, we did our calculations and it would have been 27 minutes so the water would have moved very slowly off of prairie if I did our calculations. It would have moved primarily as sheet flow if it moved at all. And I'm probably being very fair with that. That number probably would be a lot higher. Um, the longer it takes for the water to flow off a site, the smaller the peak is going to be. If that water all rushes to the outlet at the same time, the peak is going to be higher. So as we move into agriculture, that time of concentration moves down to 22 minutes. And then if I calculate post-development, let's say I calculate it at 17 minutes. So the water is moving off almost twice as fast as it did before. So there are a couple sections that cover the an estimate storage. So we're going to do an estimating procedure to figure out a rough size and then we'll do our final basin design. So this is just how this site might look. This is an example of a 20 acre site. Now I'm gonna quickly go over traditional methods, how I was taught. Um, and it's a version of the modified rational method. How many people around here have used that? Modified rational method. A few hands. Good, not too many, that's, that's good. Um, because I, I, I was taught this way and there are, there are, there are some things I'm going to highlight about it. Um, the reason why we use the rational method, it was very simple to do before the era of computers. You could do it by hand, you could do it with a calculator. Um, it was simple to do. Um, you can do it very easily with a spreadsheet. But a lot of the TR55 methods, if you didn't have computing power, it was tough to do some of this modeling. So they came up with this kind of shorthand method, but it does have some limitations. So you basically are, are solving for the required storage with this equation here. And this is, this is uh, in the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual as a reference though, because we do use it for estimation sometimes still. But for this 20 acre site, it has a, the rational method has a runoff coefficient, which runs on a scale from zero to one. So it's a little different than a curve number but it's basically telling you that, well, for whatever, um, this runoff coefficient would tell you well, whatever it rains, about 38% is gonna run off. Um, and then we've got uh, time of concentration at 27 minutes, and if you go through the calculations here, you'll find out that it says we need about 50,000 cubic feet of storage. So we would size a basin, and let's say we figured out it's gonna be five feet deep at the high water level, and that would give us a 15 inch diameter pipe if I go through my outlet calculations, and that gives me a release rate for that big storm of 10 CFS, or at least that's what it would say in my stormwater report. So we do this, in, you know, it's very easy to do with a spreadsheet. It's, it's pretty much, you just put things into columns, you put your, your runoff coefficient here, you've got rainfall and time, and that calculates the volume in versus the volume out. And basically you just look for the big number on the chart. And when you find the big number, that's how much storage you need and it just happens to be 27 minutes here. One little cheat I will note that I've seen a lot of times is because the rainfall rate guides in the stormwater management manuals skip minutes. They go 5, 10, 15, 30. Some people will do the calcs and go 5, 10, 15, 30, and that's all the values they will give you. 
Well, you see if you project the rainfall between those points, my high point actually falls at 27, which is higher than the value I'd get at 30 or 15. So you might shave 15, 20% off your required storage if you skip time intervals. So that's, that's one little shortfall of the method there. Um, the benefits are it's very simple to do. You know, you've got your outflow, but the, the, the thing is though, we're not generating real true to life outflow or inflow hydrographs. If you looked on this on a graph, the inflow would be a big rectangle and the outflow would be a big rectangle. And that's not how it happens. When we get a rainfall event, the water comes in and it goes out. So you get more of a curve. It's not gonna full flush and then just stop. That's just not the way that it works. It also is designing for a very short, intense rain event. So you got a 100 year storm that our optimum time was 27 minutes. Well, if I do the math with the old rainfall rates, it was 5.3 inches an hour. It sounds like a lot. But my storm is only 27 minutes long. If I do the math, it's a 2.4 inch rainfall event, which is 0.9 tenths of an inch of runoff. So, you know, we were talking before that our 100 year storm might be seven inches of rain in a day. And now I've designed my basin to manage the water from a, an event that's about two inches of rain, two and a half inches of rain, of which less than an inch is actually being modeled as runoff. So we also don't have management for small storms. This is only looking at the 100 year storm. I don't have any hydrographs, so I can't tell if this basin is in a series. I can't tell how that works with other basins. Are, are their peaks going to line up and create a higher peak flow or are they going to offset each other so they actually benefit one another? So maybe one basin is letting water out faster while the other is holding it back and as a system they are working better. I really, I really just don't know from this. It's just giving me a volume. So um, I'm going to walk through how we can still use this procedure, but it's only used for initial estimation of your detention. I'm also going to walk through another method that uses TR55 to estimate uh, basin sizing. And this first method is the modified rational for initial estimation. Again, this is just for estimation. Um, we're going to solve for the allowable release rate from agriculture for one setting because there are some communities that if you, if you look at the 100 year pre-settlement release rate, it may be higher than the five year ag rate. So there are some communities that may still say we want you to maintain that five year ag rate because our storm system, sewer systems have been designed on that and we want to restrict that um, flow more. So we're going to use that in this case. We're going to solve for the required storage. We're going to add an adjustment factor to account for this small intense rainfall setup. So for our 20 acre site, we do the equations that are in that table, and these again are outlined in the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual. And in this case, we get a storage of about 47,000, which is similar to what we got before, but the adjustment factor that's used, which is basically a ratio of the rainfall you get from a three-year storm over the storm of optimum duration. Um, so we have 4.23 inches of rain, which is a three-year rainfall volume over our event, which was 2.1 inches for that 27 minute, or 20-minute storm in this case gives us an answer of 94,000 cubic feet. So that's almost double what the other method told us. And again, so the, the spreadsheet's a little more complicated, but you can see this was again done with a spreadsheet, fairly easy to use, and it has this little correction factor in for that short duration storm. So that, that's one way of getting a target. The other way to do it is this TR55 estimation procedure. And You'll see in the Iowa Storm Management Manual, there is one line in there that says, um, TR55 is not to be used for final design. Well, it's specifically talking about this estimation procedure because there is a part of that software that you can simply go in and plug numbers in and it will give you an estimate. And this procedure does the exact same thing. But some people will read that one line out of the Stormwater Management Manual and say, see, TR55, you can't use it for final design. Well, that's not what it's saying. It's saying this estimation procedure is not your final design. You need to do the final routing for your final design. But this is, again, intended to give your initial storage. So again, we're using this ratio. And this ratio, again, was in the previous uh, slide when we were dealing with channel protection volume. You've got that allowable 
release rate over the allowable inflow to the basin, that ratio, you plug it into the formula, you multiply the ratio by, by the volume that's generated, and that gives you the estimate of storage. So you're going to have to run the TR55 software calculation and get the values of the output and to solve the equations above. So again, we're looking at the same site, um, pre-settlement conditions, native prairie, or curve number 58, and a time of concentration of 27. And we're going to look at agriculture and run a model for that, and the single family and run a model for that. And the nice thing about software now with tier 55, and it's just, you know, you build one model, and it's as easy as changing the curve number and the time of concentration and running, it, say, running a save as and running another model. So it's not real time intensive to do three different models here. And this is the output we would get from that. And I apologize, I don't have the time to walk through an actual software example today uh, for that. But if I, I, if I put those values into the software and I got the output, this is what I would see. Our pre-settlement column, our agriculture and post-development. And some things that you'll note here is that our, in our pre-settlement condition, this is our one-year outflow rate, or peak flow rate is 0.4. Our developed conditions is 10.9. So that's a peak rate increase of 2,700% for that two-year storm is what it's predicting. And a volume increase of about 500%. So you can see why our urban storms again are so, or urban creeks are so flashing during these common storms. The ratios, the percentages are much better down here for the 100 year, but again, we're talking much larger volumes. You're going from 39 uh, cubic feet per second up to 86 and about a 200% increase in runoff volume is what the model would project. So we're going to look at all of these because these are setting our benchmarks. So this is our inflow our basin and these are going to set our standards for our outflow. And I've highlighted these in green because we will use the pre-settlement rates as our outflows for these storms. But then once we get to the 50 and 100, you'll see that these numbers are higher than the five-year undeveloped agriculture rate. So you may have a community that says, you know what, we want that five-year undeveloped agriculture rate to be our maximum allowable in the 100-year. So that would supersede the pre-settlement rates here because that number is lower than these two. And if we would walk through this, I mean, did you see the, the, the pre-settlement rate is down here in red, and this is our inflow to our basin in green, and this is for a one-year storm. So again, you can get a better picture of it. And the first uh, part we're going to go through, again, we walk, I'll go through this kind of quickly because we already did this in the small storm section that we're just proceeding. We had that multi-step procedure to channel, calculate the channel uh, protection volume. So the first three steps are the curve number and our rainfall. And then we're going to take our output and use it to calculate, find the amount of runoff, which for that one year storm is 0.54 inches. If we do the calculations there, so our runoff volume in cubic feet, it gave us 39,300. We do this conversion to get it into inches. And then the unit peak discharge rate, we take that 10.9 CFS, which is the peak rate of flow for the one year event and we convert that into cubic foot per second per square mile per inch by that. So we take it times 20 divided by 640 and then multiply it by, or, and in the bottom there we also multiply it by the, or divide it by the, the uh, 0.54 inches to get our unit peak rate of discharge. And we go to the chart, unit peak rate of discharge is like we did before we draw over. We find out that our ratio is 0 .4, 0 0.03 and we multiply that by the peak rate to get our allowable release rate and then we plug that into the, the equation to find the ratio of runoff or volume required. And we get a ratio of 0.641. So whatever our runoff volume is, we multiply it by 0.641 and that's how much storage we need. So that, if we do that, we're managing this channel protection volume. And that same formula we can repeat for every storm event. So that same procedure for figuring out the initial storage we need for channel protection volume, you can go through the same procedure for each storm event. So you would use our, our, target, our target release rates, which for the channel protection volume is that real extended detention, so it has a lower value. But then for these other ones, we're simply going to use the pre-settlement rate for these conditions, and then when that five-year agricultural rate was lower, we use those. So those go into the uh, 
allowable, the QO. So you, you've got your QO, this is your allowable discharge, this is your inflow that we calculated using TR55 for developed conditions. So it's simply out over in, and this is your ratio. You plug it into the formula. This is your storage ratio. Our output from TR55 will tell us how much runoff is coming for each event. So you just multiply this by that. And now you have your estimates for every single rainfall event. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of step by step, but it's, it's, you just kind of walk across. You, you know your outflow rates, you know your inflow rates, that gives you this ratio. You do that formula in pink from before for each one. You just plug in that ratio and then multiply it by the runoff volume that we get out of TR55 for the developed condition, and that gives us these estimates. So this is telling us, this method tells me I need 104,000 for that basin. So we started at 50. Now this one's telling us at 100. And what I would actually say to you is in practice what I have seen is this is a good start, but I usually start by taking that number and multiplying it by uh, adding 10%, because sometimes it's a little bit low. So really we're looking at, you're wanting to have a basin. If we figure we need 104,000, I designed a quick basin. So let's just kind of take a step back. We did our initial estimation. Now you design your site and you kind of know about how much space you need. So I used that example and figured out, well, I need a detention basin that has this much storage for those events. And I said, well, you know what? I want a detention basin that only gets five feet deep in a 100-year storm. And maybe it only gets two feet deep in the one-year storm. And I tried to come up with a grading plan that had contour areas that gave me the storage to match those conditions. So, so here at the different elevations, you can see the area in the contour, and then you can figure the volume in between each contour to figure your total storage. So, and then I added a foot of freeboard just to make sure, you know, it, when it's full, I mean, if they grade it wrong or, you know, that never happens, right? <laughs> no one ever grades anything wrong. Um, they're always balls on. Um, but uh, they, uh, you know, so we have a foot of freeboard in there. Plus, you want to have a well-defined overflow spillway. Well, you can't have a well-defined overflow spillway unless the most of the berm is a little higher than where it's going to overflow. So we have a little extra storage in there. You know, then then the key thing is when you're you've got your size. Now you have to figure out your outlets, and this is going to be an iterative process. Um, you're going to have to just find out what works best. You've got a different options that are laid out in the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual. So you've got, uh, in 2C12, it talks about different outlet structures and how to calculate the outflow rates from those. So use that as a reference, but there's orifices and perforated weirs, or sorry, perforated risers, pipes and culverts, a sharp crested weir, broad crested weir, B-notch weirs. There's, there's all sorts of options. And I suggest working from the bottom up. Get a outlet that works for your one year event for small, figure out your high water elevation, and then set your next level. Design a weir or something for that and work your way up from the bottom. And a lot of the new third party software, it's very simple to go in and run a model and put in your outlet conditions and run it. And if it works, great. If not, tweak a few things. Make the weir a little smaller, raise it up a little bit, make the pipe size a little bit smaller. And you know, in 30 minutes, you can go through a, a final design of, of, of how your outlet condition might work. It's a little more difficult if you're doing it all by hand. But um, so we've already done this. We've solved for the extended detention time. Now we're getting into 8, 9, and 10. And this was our initial basin design sizing. So let's say we went through this whole process, and for the mainly because of the time we have today, um, let's say we solved all these things and we figured out we need a three-inch orifice to manage that water, the channel protection volume. You know, we're going to set a higher stage above the two-year level to manage the larger storms. The second stage is two feet up off the bottom. It's a three-foot-long weir and the wall of a concrete area intake. The third stage is a 20-foot long weir. So if you have three feet in the front, front if it's a four-sided area intake, three feet down in the front at a lower level, two feet above it, the sides are going to go around. That's the perimeter of the other weir. So you really have four sides of an inlet. So it's not a very complicated structure. And the fifth stage, or the fourth stage, is going to be a broadcasted weir, broad crested weir, which is just basically a dip in the dam. So the water can spill over. And we do that a quarter foot above the 100-year elevation in this example. So, and if you're modeling this with third-party software, one thing I'd like to note, 
if you ever see the little button that says multi-stage, yes or no, what that's asking you is, does the runoff through that outlet go through the ultimate culvert that leaves the basin? If you say yes, it's, gonna spill, it's assuming it's spilling into an inlet and going whatever, it'll say culvert A, that is usually the culvert that is leaving your basin. And so if culvert B might be the little pipe that comes out of the inlet that that pipe is going out of. So it's assuming all the runoff that you click multi-stage is going out that outlet pipe. If you say no, it's saying it's going a different way. Like the broad crested weir, it's not going to go out the outlet pipe of the basin. It's spilling over. So if multi-stage, you'd say no to that question. So. So in this case, all of, all of the outlets we modeled would be multi-stage except for going over the dam. And if we actually route that, this is what we're going to find our results. The high water of our one-year storm gets 1 1.9 feet deep, and I was looking for two, so I'm, I'm good. My target release rate was 0.33 CFS. It's predicting 0.32. I got it. And my routing result, my initial estimate was 25,300 cubic feet. It's 26,200. That's pretty close. If we look again here at the 10-year storm is another benchmark. I said, well, I don't want that getting more than about three feet deep. The modeling says 3.07. My target release rate's 11.8. My predicted is 11.5. My initial estimate of storage was this, and you can see it's about 10% higher. So that's why I say we'll add 10%. So, so again, I've got a basin that works. Now my 100-year, you'll, you'll notice since I'm, I'm restricting this a little bit more because of the agriculture, it's going to bump up a little bit more. But again, I was shooting for five feet of depth. I got 4.9. My target release rate was this. This is my predicted release rate. And my routing result, 112,000. So again, we started with rational method, the old method saying 50,000. Now we're up to 112. But this basin now manages the full spectrum of storm events. Everything from a small storm, it's going to release in one year a very small amount of water. It's going to draw down over a 24 to 48 hour period. This is going to help protect the stream. And we're also releasing the, the medium storms at pre-settlement rates. And actually, these larger storms in this case are getting managed even a little more strictive than that because we're going back to agricultural five-year release rates. And I highlighted that again. You'll, you'll see the peak dime if you actually get more information from the modeling results. So we can see that for a one-year storm, our peak time delay is 554 minutes. So we're nine hours delayed after the storm. That goes down with the bigger storms, but you can see we're still getting good delays. Our peak rate reduction, we're at 97% for the one-year storm. We're at 74% for the 100-year. And there's our inflow and our release rates there. So, and, and you'll notice that the runoff volume, some of those things go up a little bit, again, because of that. We're over-detaining those larger storms for that agricultural rate. And this, this is a chart we might get out of the third-party software packages where it shows you the release rates, stage storage for every foot, how much water is being released out of that basin. And you'll see here when the curve is up like that, the orifice is controlling it. When it curves like this, that's where we're weir. our weir is controlling it. And again, orifice control here, and then there's our weir. And for one year, this again, in versus out, one year, five year, and 100 year. So one thing you'll note is that if you do the math, this basin would occupy about 15% of the watershed impervious area. Um, you know, you're talking about 150 to th by 300 at the top. I assume six to one side slope, so it'd be easily maintainable. We want to make sure we've got positive drainage in the dry example, and we've got the multi-stage structure. Now, I've got about 10, 15 minutes to cover the other variations on... Um, Probably about 10. 10, okay, we'll shoot for 10. Because yeah, we got started because of the break. Yes. We got started a little bit late. So just, and just to highlight again, I, I kind of highlight it throughout, so I'm not going to repeat it too much. Again, this, this is our, our rational method example, 50,000, um, and, and the difference of storage that we were going to get need. And also, we used to have one size fits all. And if you do the backwards approach and size the, you know, run a TR55 model through our little rational method, method, 
basin, this is what you'd see, is about the 10 year storm, that basin is full and it overtops. And even though my report said my release rate was gonna be 10, 10 CFS, well, it's going over the dam and out uncontrolled. So my actual release rate was probably gonna be more like 73, even though my report had said 10. Um, and again, the ice swim target for our small storm, we would say 0.33. Well, this predicted for the rational method basin would be about four CFS. So it'd be about 1100% you know, above what our, our channel protection volume target would be. So I'm gonna, what I will say about the next two things, I'm gonna briefly take you through the design of wet ponds and construction wetlands. And they're basically the sizing practice is of just variations on that theme. There's not really much difference to that. The difference is, is what's in the bottom? Well, a wet pond, instead of having a dry bottom, it's got a wet pool and a multi-stage outlet. And the advantage of these systems are you can use them for water quality as water quality practice. But I would caution and say that there, it's not as simple as just saying, well, my water quality volume is X, and if I have that much water in the pool, I'm good. There is a multiplier. You probably want to have about two times that water quality volume in the pool to make it work. But our design approach is, is very, very similar, um, except for like the features around the pond. You're, you're gonna be very concerned about the mean depth. You wanna have a nice aquatic bench around the edge that's about 10 to 20, 15 feet wide, and it's good for vegetation. It also deters geese, and it's good for public safety because if a child falls in the pond and the water is only a foot deep, they can stand up and walk out versus being uh, in the deeper water. You know, also be aware that some ponds may need permitting. So um, there are deer in our regulations if you're designing a big enough pond. And uh, you know, usually if your maximum depth is 10 to 13 feet, you, you have a reduced risk of thermal stratification. Um, there's just some other factors and I don't have time to go through a lot of the, 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 just know that there are setback requirements and size requirements that are all spelled out in the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual. And again, we're gonna have multi-stage outlets and want to have good landscaping. This is a cut, uh, cut side uh, cross section of that aquatic bench. It's also a good idea to have another safety bench above it, if for nothing else, for maintenance. You're gonna wanna have vehicular access around your pond so you can maintain things when, when they need repairs. And an example of a, a, a multi-stage outlet for a pond, one feature that's a little different than a dry basin, you might actually wanna have the ability to draw that water out from below the surface because you don't wanna take the high oxygen water off the top, you'd like to pull it out from two or three feet below and you can do that with a reverse slow pipe or we've actually used Agrigene Structures, which is a company out of Adair that makes those where the stop logs you put in them and the water comes in and has to flow up over the stop log and out, but it still allows you to draw the water off the bottom of the basin. So I'm quickly gonna go through the design example because it basically is very similar to a dry pond in the way you size it. You're gonna go through the same calculation methods, you're gonna look at the pre-settlement conditions, you're gonna look at the existing conditions and the post-development, you're gonna size it the same way. The only real difference is, is you're getting a little bit of storage, first of all, probably more storage in the bottom because you're not starting at zero at the outlet. You have an area that it spreads over at the very bottom of the basin. And the other thing is you can calculate you know, the amount of water quality volume that you need and then figure out, well, is my pool volume maybe two times that? Then I have a water quality practice. So that's another, another thing that you can do there. Um, important feature of wet ponds is we need to have four bays as that water enters the pond where you can collect the sediment. This is even much more important on a wet pond because nobody likes dredging. It's expensive, it's messy. Um, nobody wants to spend their money with that. If you have an effective uh, four bay that captures about an inch per impervious acre drained, you can collect that sediment at the inlet and you wanna make sure you have vehicular access for something like a backhoe or a vac truck where they can scoop or suck that sediment out and it will collect there and you will need to maintain it, otherwise they won't work. Um, but it will keep you, if you maintain that over time, it will keep you from the more expect, expensive process of dredging. But the process is very similar except you're calculating you know, how, you know, you're calculating how much water quality volume you have and assigning that to the pool and making sure that your pool is big enough you're still gonna have the staged, staged outlet controls almost exactly the same as a dry detention basin. So I'll kind of spare you some of the details there. And in fact, what we would find is 
in this example, if I had the exact same site, the, the outlet design would be almost the same except for that low flow pipe would be below the surface, would be actually um, below the water surface there. And what you'll actually see in this case, we actually have better, in the one year storm, we have better performance. We actually have a longer delay, almost 11 hours, 10 and a half hours um, for that. But as far as the hydrology goes, other than that, the wet pond is going to perform uh, pretty slimmer to the dry pond and you're going to design it in the same way. And the final thing I'm going to cover here is stormwater constructed wetlands. And I've actually had some pretty good success with these uh, practices. They are not using existing wetlands to manage your stormwater. That is against the law. But I want to be clear with that. But this is actually building uh, constructed wetlands. Uh, and it's a mix of shallow and deep water. Basically, you're going to do micro topography. You're going to design a basin. And you can even design a regular dry basin to do this and just kind of alter it. And you're just going to develop a series of small pools. You're going to have little berms that are a couple feet high and little depressions that are a couple feet low um, that basically create a stormwater maze. And it makes the water really work hard to get off the site. This is really good in areas that have high groundwater. So if you're thinking, well, I can't do an, uh, uh, an infiltration practice because I have a high groundwater table, well, maybe this is a solution for you then. And they have different elements. You've got your pretreatment four bay areas. So this is actually one that I designed in a neighborhood called Prairie Trail in Ankeny. Um, and so we had a public street. We had about 20 acres of, of residential housing coming into this thing. So we had three outlets that came into three separate little four bays. And then we had little rock check dams where the water would have to perk through the rock check dams to get into the um, lower marsh and high marsh areas. So it would come out the, the little rock check dams and the water would have to w work through these really shallow uh, areas of low and high marsh. Some of them are only six inches deep and some are only 18 inches deep. So these will fill in with vegetation over time. And then there's a little a deep water pool area that's important if you want to have fish. And fish are nice and because as they work their way out, they eat mosquito eggs and other things that nobody likes. So it's nice to have a micro pool area if you can. But you know, really stress the pretreatment, the four bays, because you want to get that sediment out so it doesn't fill in your wetland. Um, but you can see this water would have had a path of about 200 feet to get off the site if it was a dry basin. It now has to move 1,100 feet to get out of this. So it really has to work hard. It's going to really slow the water down. And this has been a very, very um, successful feature there. In the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual, it basically has a recipe card in sections 2H1 and 2 on how to design a stormwater wetland. Basically, you're figuring your water quality volume and you assign it to the different areas. There's a low marsh zone uh, that's a little deeper. There's the high marsh that's like shallow. And then there's those areas that are just above the surface. And you assign the water quality volume to those areas and that allows you to figure out the footprint you need. You know, if I have an average depth of a foot deep and I need this much storage, it allows you to know how much area you need for that. Um, again, you're going to need a multi-stage outlet because the controls are very similar to that for a standard uh, dry detention basin. So the design of those is not much different. But there's different options in these recipe cards. There's a shallow wetland option. Again, you see these different micro topography in there. There's the pond wetland system. There's a shallow EDWIS system. So there's a lot of creativity that you can show um, in these systems and how they work. Uh, in the manual, it also has some, uh, some feasibility requirements, just like all the practices, different setbacks from different things. So be, just be familiar with that. If for some reason you're trying to put these practices in an area with an A or B soil, you might actually have to put a liner in because it if the soils are perk, perk high, the, the basin, the wetland will go dry. And a wetland that's not wet <coughs> is not a wetland. So it won't function the way you want. So, um, but there also is a step-by-step -step procedure in there, um, which again is somewhat similar, similar to the other procedures as far as the actual sizing of it. Just to highlight, that's in, in that chapter 2H2, which is the constructed wetland chapter. And I, again, we'll just kind of flip through this quickly because the only thing that's real different about the sizing of this is assigning the water quality volume. So if we figured our water quality volume for this site is 31,800 cubic feet, you've got these different options. The shallow wetland says you want to have 
40% in the pool, 60% in the shallow marsh, and 0% extended detention. So you can figure out, okay, 40% of this is this, and 60% of this is this. All right, well, I kind of figure out that I need, if I do all the math, I need about a half acre wetland. I have about this, this much area and three feet deep, and this much area and one feet deep, so I can get that much storage. And then the same thing with the other systems. Pond wetlands, the, the ratio is a little different. It's 70-30. The extended detention, you're actually doing some of that extended detention in the, in the storage above the water surface. So you sign some of it there. So it's the smallest of the three options. So you kind of pick the one that works best for your site and, and go with it that way. And then the rest of it, you design the multi-stage controls just like you did a dry basin, just like you did a wet basin. Um, you end up with a, a similar, a similar kind of uh, similar system of outlet controls that manage the large and the small storms. And uh, just one final note here before I finish up, uh, caution points for detention design, uh, input concerns, you know, making sure you're doing your calculations right. You know, if you're calculating your time of concentration uh, incorrectly, uh, one thing that, that can be done quite frequently is miscalculating the sheet flow. Sheet flow is when the water is flowing like a sheet. It's flowing very uniformly, usually over a flat surface like a parking lot. It usually won't go for any longer than 100 feet, and it won't go once it can collect to a point. So if you have a low spot in a parking lot, or if you have a rear yard swale, or a gutter, that's where you stop. Because if you keep calculating that sheet flow going on, it's going to give you a very long time of concentration, which lowers, when you do your stormwater calcs, it lowers your peak rates. So don't, you know, if, if you have a residential setting, your sheet flow is not going to be probably longer than 50 feet you know, in the, in the front yard or the backyard. I've seen times where people would put 1,100 feet in there, you know, and they'd have a time of concentration of 50 minutes. Well, I can tell you if it rains, it's not taking 50 minutes for the water to go from my porch to the inlet down the street. So just be aware of that, making sure you're picking the right uh, runoff coefficient or curve number, you know, outlet concerns, make sure you're using multi-stage outlets. You're wanting to make sure you're using the right formulas and measured the right way. Um, you know, make sure you're checking the multi-stage conditions appropriately if you're using the third-party software. Physical design, pretreatment is very, very important, especially in your wet practices. If they fill up full of sediment, you're going to have a lot of hard maintenance on your hands. So four bays are very important. Um, you know, the depth of storage, especially we talked about not having that big bounce for the one-year storm. You know, usually one to two feet is a, a, an area I'm comfortable with. I mean, you're all, if you're designers, that's up to you what you want to do, but that's a, an area I'm comfortable with. Um, trash grates. If you have an outlet with a trash grate, I would never go less than three inches, especially in an area that's got a fairly large watershed. We had some where we did two inch spacing and they collected uh, corn stalks and grass like crazy. And if the public works isn't maintaining them, they're like, hey, the basin overflowed last night. It's like, well, yeah, I can't see your inlet because it's buried in clippings. You know, so you want to catch pop bottles and things like that, but not necessarily some of those things. In the big storm, you'd like some of those things to, to be able to get. Otherwise, routine maintenance also corrects that problem. Um, let's see, having well-defined overflow spillway. And finally, landscaping and maintenance. You know, we want to have the right vegetation for the site. You know, some of these areas are going to be wet, so picking the right seed mixes, deciding who's going to maintain it, and making sure you have the funding in place to actually do that. And at proper access pass. If you design a detention practice and just cram it in somewhere and you've got no way to drive equipment around it or get access to the site, you're going to have issues because you're going to be like, okay, I've got to go remove sediment or I've got to go fix something and I've got to get this piece of equipment between these two houses. How is that going to work? And if I don't have access, so just consider those things in initial design. And with that, I'm all finished. Okay. Maybe, maybe what we'll do at this point, are there any questions at all? This could be a question and answer period with Greg before we go into the checklist. I've bored them all to death. Uh, is this a QA session? <coughs> yes, this is, this is a QA section and then we'll go into session and then we'll go into the uh, checklist.
The question from Amy was if we have a site with a lot of topography, um, you know, and we wanted to do infiltration practices, you know, what are some things we could do? You know, that can be a challenge. You know, it just depends on, you know, how much room you have. Um, some ways that you can do, uh, you basically for, for like bioretention, you want to have a nice flat area. So you can kind of work on contour. If, if you kind of visualize, so if I have a hill here, instead of trying to put my practice this way, I could develop a set of stepped practices if you have enough space where you're routing the water this way and it's got to run along the contour. You know, maybe it's only five or ten feet wide at the bottom, then you have a little shallow berm and then it hops down to the next practice. Um, that's one option. Um, you know, if you start to get real steep, you know, that might be where you have to look at some other alternatives too. There's you know, there's an array of practices in the stormwater management manual. I mean, if you're really tight and you have topography, there, there's some underground systems and things that might work um, because you'd have that relief to get the water out, you know, the elevation to work with. Um, obviously, if you go underground, it's more expensive. Um, but I'd say, you know, if you, if you have the room to kind of work on contour and step things down, that would be a good approach if you have a lot of topography. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do they change? You know, I am not exactly 100% sure of that. I could probably I, tell you some of it. Okay. <laughs> um, some of it can be because there has been such severe erosion that has occurred that you've lost a lot of the topsoil and you're in that B, B horizon, the heavier clay soils. And with some of the the farming practices that are used in some areas, that's exactly what is happening. That's why we're seeing more and more drainage put in, especially especially where I, the part of the state I'm in. Um, that, that can be one reason, yes. And over the years in a lot of agricultural areas, we've obviously lost some of our soil depth as well. So it's probably leading to higher runoff rates. And it's not across the board, but like in Polk County, for example, you know, there are still some soils that are categorized as B soils, but it used to be almost across the board that they were B or, or they'd say B if they're drained and D if they're not. Um, but now you see a lot of them are C, you know, probably better than half are C soils. So I think the combination of those two factors probably played into it. I'm guessing there were some studies that validated that. And I've just something I've noticed over about the last two years, if you go and if you still look it up in the books, it'll tell you it's a B. But if you look online with the updated tables, it'll say it's a C soil. You had mentioned that if it dries out, if it infiltrates, that that was an issue. Mm -hmm. and I'm not understanding why, from a water quality perspective or a storage perspective, why having it dry out would be a problem because you could always plant it to adjust. Yeah, and that's a good question. And from that perspective, I think you're fine. I mean, if your pro sole purpose is to infiltrate the water, well, essentially what you've done, if it, if it does dry out, essentially what you've done is you've built a bioretention cell. The problem is, is if you designed it as a wetland and you seeded it as a wetland and the plants thought that they were really wet plants, you know, you may have complete die off and you may have some issues there. So what I'd say is if you're, if you're in a, an area with an A or a B soil, you might trend to more doing a bioretention practice in the first place. Um, but if you were really wanting a wetland for some reason, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure some of our grading contractors could compact that soil nice and good to make sure it holds water. <laughs> I think, I think we know how to do that pretty well. Um, so there are ways to deal with it, but it's just something if you, if you because you're just doing micro topography, if they just do, if they do kind of an easy footprint and it's got a real sandy soil, you might come back and be like, especially if, you know, if you were using it, say, as a mitigation practice or something and you were relying on a wetland to be there and it's not, that, that could be an issue. So, so it just sounds like understanding the soils and the, what the hydrology is gonna be ahead of time before you do your seeding plan is really the trick. That's right. You, you know, if you're expecting to have um, really wet conditions, you're going to specify a much different seed mix than if you think it's going to be very dry and arid. One other comment I was going to make is um, conservation design, looking at uh, conservation design developments, a starting point for that is to try and minimize grading and you would consult the soil survey and look at the soils that are there. If you have soils that are A or B, they would have high percolation, infiltration percolation rates. Those might be areas that you would set aside 
for bioretention cells or and or rain gardens and infiltration practices. If you have soils that are in depressional areas that have low perk rates, that have C and D soils, especially D soils, what kind of practices do you think you might put there? That might be your constructed wetland or your, your wet detention. So keeping those points in mind, you might be able to minimize some masquerading that, that occurs in the development as well. And there's, um, in the earlier parts, we didn't really cover this today, but in the earlier parts of the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual, there are some different kind of broader picture chapters. And one of them covers kind of a selection table. Like if you have different soil types and infiltration rates or different drainage areas, you know, what practices might be appropriate. So you, in part of that site evaluation, if you saw you had the A and B soils, you might go through that table and say, well, this really isn't trending towards a constructed wetland. I really don't want that. I would rather have my bioretention practice and, and vice versa. Or, you know, um, one thing that's nice about constructed wetlands is they tend to be on the scale of larger drainage areas, you know, where a bioretention practice is usually a smaller drainage areas unless you can split it up into multiple cells. So, you know, all those things, the drainage area, the soils, all those things you kind of have to look at collectively and go through the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual and see, okay, what is the best fit on our site based on what we have? It's going to be different on every site. And just as a follow-up on that, um, so sometimes these low areas are existing wetlands and the the practice goes there and, and it's mitigated, so it's a permitted impact. Um, and we've seen this a lot where, again, there, there was a wetland there, they put their stormwater practice there, and it's mitigated somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So um, is there a concern with, um, I guess, inputting the stormwater into the groundwater? Because it sounds like with the wetland system, you're purposely intercepting the water table and in this case you would be intercepting the water table either with a wet pond or a wetland system is that okay it, it could be if you if you have you know if you're going to have say hot spots in the watershed like uh, things like gas stations fueling stations things like that you may want to have further levels of pretreatment like grease interceptors and oil water separators things like that could be of concern um, usually if you're if you're in the constructed wetland setting you know if, if that groundwater interaction is going in you're probably getting a little more of the into the wetland versus the out so but in any of these practices you're gonna have to be a little cautionary if you have something that's a real pollutant of concern like a hot spot like a gas station or something that you may you know if you're gonna infiltrate into the groundwater you may want to have some higher level of pretreatment there are two types of natural wetlands. There are discharge wetlands and there are recharge wetlands. Um, my personal opinion is that you don't, you don't want to be diverting dirty stormwater into an existing, if you want to call it pristine wetland, um, unless it's treated. But I, I would probably use a constructed wetland before I would be diverting dirty water to a pristine wetland. Well, if that's what you're referring to. No, I'm just oh. saying, like, in a lot of cases, there might be, I'm going to say, uh, a degraded wetland that, again, is going to be impacted for your stormwater detention. You've mitigated, you're going to mitigate it with the Corps of Engineers. This is where you're going to put your practice. It's a permitted impact to wetland. But I'm just wondering with designing it, and I, I like that, if, if it's a hot spot, that makes sense, whereas if you're inputting in, Especially if it's if it's a recharge wetland, it's a zone where you're recharging groundwater. I would be very cautious if you have if you're 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 collecting runoff from hot spots, gas stations, um, some industries or businesses. Yes. And, and usually too, if if you're in a situation like that and you have to do the permitting, there the you know the core makes you show cause why you can't do something. Right. Different too. Um, so I, I I mean I I've had situations like that where we've had to mitigate because of, I mean, it's kind of ironic that you're putting in a stormwater practice, but you're yet you're mitigating a wetland because of what's there, you know. Um, but, you know, there's a procedure for that. And uh, just making sure that the key thing to, to, again, I said it before, but just to stress, if it's an existing wetland, we're not talking about taking water and diverting it to, to an existing wetland because that's not allowed under the law. I mean, you can't fill a wetland and you can't also alter the drainage into a wetland. Those are things that are permitted through the Corps of Engineers and you get to go through this fun joint permitting application project process which everybody enjoys so much. Um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of 
you know, I think that's the big thing is if you're building on an area like that, you know, looking at the hot spots. You all should have, or each one of you should have a CD. And on the C CD are copies of checklists for most of the infiltration-based practices that we talked about, that I talked about earlier. And they're, did you just put the wizard forms, did you just put the wizard forms on, Amy? Okay, so they're in a format, they're, they're in a PD, PDF format that you can fill in and um, save and then send to somebody. So I'm going to go over those checklists. I think the checklists will aid you in your design and will aid any city staff that are reviewing the practices. And this is a combination effort between the city of Coralville, Iowa City, the city of North Liberty, Solon, and Rest Branch, as well as um, the University of Iowa. So with that, we're gonna start with bioretention cells and I'll let Greg take, take that one. If you could go through real briefly. Okay. We haven't rehearsed this one. Right. So who knows what'll happen. That's right. We could get really wild here. Yeah. All right, I think that the main thing with these checklists and um, that they've developed are for is to give guidance, first of all, to the designer of the things that you're wanting to be clued into as you're designing the practice and also providing that information to the city in a way that they can evaluate the practice and determine, okay, does it look like everything is going right and that this practice is sized appropriately. So, uh, and I can barely read this on here. You might have to read the screen because yeah. we have a different view on the computer. Yeah, anyway, I don't know why I need this. There we go. The, uh, you see the first line there obviously is the drainage area. Uh, it's asking you how much of the drainage area is impervious surface and, you know, so obviously that goes into the equation, figuring out how much, what your water quality volume is. You know, what's your side area, how much is it impervious. They're also asking you if they've done any soil management, soil water quality restoration. It's probably a repeated question, because again, if you have highly compacted soils, that water is going to run off that space differently. So uh, that needs to go into your, be factored into your calculations. Uh, from this, you would calculate your water quality volume, and they've been nice enough to include the equation right there for you. Um, and in this case, the bioretention cell, uh, they're asking you to list the surface area of the bioretention cell, and they have the equation for that there too. They're also, if you need more information about that practice, because we, you know, we could do a we could do a two or three day shred on some of these things, but we're trying to give you this in an afternoon. If you want more information on that, um, there's the cha BioCell chapter has a step-by-step -step procedure on the design of a bioretention cell. But that's the, the sizing equation is basically right there that figures the footprint that you need at the bottom of that, of that area. And that's very important, having the right footprint that's nice and level so that the water has enough area to spread out and infiltrate. Your ponding depth is on this list, and that's very important. When you're looking six to nine inches is pretty typical. Um, you wouldn't want too much more than that because the water wouldn't drain down fast enough, and if it was too shallow, you're not gonna have very much storage. And then they want you to list the proposed dimensions, uh, describing the pretreatment method, and we've talked about how important that is. Uh, discuss your soils investigations, and then uh, the other factors that go into sizing it the sand, the, your blend of your sand mix, of your, sorry, your amended soil mix, your sand topsoil and compost, and then the quantities you've calculated for that practice. And in terms of the dimensions, um, it's recommended, the manual recommends that you go with bioretention cells and rain gardens that are long and narrow rather than square shaped, and that, a lot of that is related to maintenance. So you have access, so you don't have to do a lot of stepping, that, that you can reach into the, the bioretention cell or rain garden rather than having to, s to step into that a lot. So yeah, if you have a practice that's like 10 or 15 feet across, you can reach in from the side usually to do your maintenance. Also, when you're building it, you can work from the side without having to have the heavy equipment on the footprint of the cell. Another factor is, too, is if, if the water runs through the cell in a longer length, it's got more vegetation to run through, so it improves the filtration. We're avoiding that flow path shortcutting in that manner. Um, then you have the depth of the rock chamber, how much rock, um, basically all the elements that are laid out in the storm, Iowa Stormwater Management Manual, you know, they just want you to list, okay, how much have you provided and what's the quantity, 
checking those separation dif distances, describing your perforated outlets. Basically, you're just listing a variety of information to just show, to demonstrate that you've gone through the step-by-step -step procedure and that it actually complies with the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual. And then finally, you get down to the planting plan, um, inspection and maintenance. So they want to know what you're planting and how you plan to maintain it. And obviously, your erosion and sediment control measures. And then that is a place for them to sign off on it when it's done. Any, any questions about the bioresection cell checklist? Okay. Do you want me to do this one or you want to do it? You go right oh, ahead, hop I'm, in. Uh, then I'll do the I'm, next. I'm up again. Okay. Bioswell is kind of similar. Now, the different, does anyone know the difference between a biocell and a bioswale? There's one key difference. That's right, a bioswale conveys water. So a bioswale, a biocell is level at the bottom, length to length, side to side, it should be level. Bioswale has grade to it. So it will convey the water and actually it can be, for that reason it can be used in larger drainage areas and it can be used to, to convey large storm events. But some of the cross sections are actually quite similar. So again, the same information goes into drainage area, impervious surface, have you done a soil water management plan, discuss your invest investigations and findings, um, you're, you're going to describe your, you're going to do your water quality volume calculation, describe the cross section and the length of the bioswale, and the big thing of the length of a bioswale is you're trying to design a practice that flows the water for the water quality event at a rate of, it's, they, the target is one foot per second or less, so you're very, very slow. You can get some partial credit usually if you go up to a percent, a one and a half. But we're talking very slow flows, so you're usually going to have a very level channel. Um, so they want to know what that cross section is, and the key is you want that that rate of flow for about 10 minutes or longer. To get if you get 10 minutes of flow through a bias swale at one foot per second or less, we assume that the water quality volume has been satisfied. So you need to have enough length to accomplish that. So if you can slow it down, you can get with a shorter, away with a shorter bioswale, but if it's longer, faster, it's gotta be longer to get that contact time. So that's, they're looking at that length of bioswale there. Oop. Looking at the cross-sectional elements, the grade, how long is it in there, the velocity, and again, the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual goes through a very detailed procedure on how to calculate uh, this. And, and all the elements, again, the, the types of soil that go in there and the quantities, basically just verifying that the 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 step-by-step -step procedure that's an ice swim is being followed. So same, same any any questions about the bioswale checklist or bioswales in general? Okay, we'll get into an enhanced rain garden, which we didn't really discuss, kind of glanced over that, but the difference between a rain garden and an enhanced rain garden is an enhanced rain garden, you might use it where you might have some, the soils are maybe leaning towards sea type, type soils and uh, kind of borderline percolation rates. So you would put a subsurface drain in, you're using modified soil, your aggregate, you're using some aggregate, but it's not quite as extensive as you would in a bioretention cell. But you go through the same, uh, you know, providing drainage area and same uh, factors as the others. And I'm trying to pick out those. I mean, you, you have to put in your modified soil and the quantities of materials, depth of rot chamber. So we'll kind of go through, glance over that. Um, Permeable pavement, this checklist, you're going through the same practices, I mean the same types of information, except they're asking here that you need to describe the type of pavement, the type of paver, the manufacture of that material. They want to know the pore space storage of that rock space in cubic feet. They want, would like to know the dimensions of the, the rock base. And of course, pre describing that pretreatment methods, soils investigation. So um, one unique feature to this is if you're going to be installing them less than 10 feet from a foundation, describe what type of waterproofing methods are going to be used. And waterproofing methods have been used in some situations, permeable papers used in areas, um, say a, 
patio pad that's right next to the house. You would want to consider putting in some sort of waterproofing. West Union in their downtown area, they put not only permeable paver streets, but permeable paver sidewalks. And so they used um, waterproof liners along, along the building interface with the, with the pavement. So. Okay, what is the slope of the bottom of the rock base? And so they're saying if the bottom of the rock base is greater than 0.5% uh, slope, they wanna know how the slope at the bottom of the rock base will be modified to maximize storage. So water does run downhill, so they wanna know what you're going to be doing um, downhill for maximizing storage. Can I make a point there? Mm -hmm. Just real quick, um, and on, on that, um, you know, obviously, if you're, especially if you have any grade that you're working with your, with your paver design, you know, the bottom of your system may be relatively flat to maximize the storage, because if you just said, well, I want a three depth rock and I've got a 5% grade, at some point, the water is literally going to be lapping up at the bottom of the paver, and there's this void of rock space here that you essentially can't count for water quality storage, because in order for it to fill, the water would actually have to be coming out of the pavers at the bottom. So that's just something to, to be aware of, especially on steeper sites. Okay. Uh, rain gardens, there's probably no need to go through this one because bioretention cells and enhanced rain gardens are very similar to this. Include that vegetation plan with spacing of plants, species of plants, uh, size of plants that you would be planting. There's guidance on species and plants in, if you Google rainscapingiowa.org, look under rain gardens, all of that guidance is, is listed there, those resources, along with layout, layout plans. Planter box design. Have any of you ever been involved in planter box? You typically would use these in ultra urban areas where you have limited green space. Anyone any experience? Okay, Amy, Amy has some experience. Yes. <laughs> um, so for these, you're going to collecting the same information um, as you would the other practices. You want to input the dimensions of the planter box, describe the soil media. There are some proprietary products that are out there, and it goes as far as proprietary. It's not just the container itself, but it's also the media. So be, be aware of that. You would want to get specifications and, and detailed information on that. But otherwise, you could use a modified soil mix um, similar to the bioretention cells. It depends on the systems that's chosen. And we go through about the same information, showing you want to show the available storage in the planter box, show your calculations, and they, they're giving you the equations right there. Um, perforated pipe, they want to know about that. The drain tile. Any soils um, investigations along with overflow. So if the planter does not manage that water quality volume as a standalone practice, how is it going to be connected in sort of that treatment train system or connected to another practice, for example, permeable pavements to manage the required water quality volume? And um, those are the checklists that are completed right now. There soon will be a checklist created for the soil management and soil quality restoration that I went through with you. That literally is, is just been completed and will be on Iowa DNR's website soon. Green roofs were just, just completing and we're starting a pretreatment section as well. So there will be checklists for those practices. And one other, one other detail that is available to you, it is not on your CDs, but there is a stormwater summary data sheet that goes through more of the detailed information um, for a stormwater management plan. So it's looking at your watershed characteristics, one year, five year, 10 year, 100 year storms. Um, you're also looking at rainfall runoff sum summary data and um, looking at total surface runoff volumes and BMP surface storage design information. So that type of checklist is available to you as well. You can contact me if you're city, I can mail that information to you as well if you don't already have it. And we put together a spreadsheet as well that, that um, sort of mimics the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual, but then also we have a model ordinance for post-construction that we just completed and it references some of the sections, cross-references some of the sections in the ordinance that's there. But you could take this and tweak it to your city's ordinance as well. 
So that is available. You can, you can contact me if you don't already have that. So are there any questions on the checklist? A tool for you, a tool for the cities? So we're sort of all on the same page. I think as a, as a designer, the checklists have been helpful for me to kind of go through and put through because it's like, not only because I use it as a designer to make sure that I'm checking all the bases before I complete a design, but then also before I submit it to a city saying, okay, you know, yeah, I've got everything here. It makes the review process a lot more streamlined, a lot better, but then it makes it easier for them to interpret my work, to see the results, kind of the summary sheet you see there kind of gives a quick summary overview of all the, of a certain practice of its size to make sure that it meets the unified sizing criteria. And then the other ones, they can actually go through and, you know, and edit and, you know, make comments right there and, you know, check, yes, does it satisfy or no, why not? It's just a, a very good way to streamline the process both on the design side but also the review side. Okay, so we're at that point where we're going to ask up, uh, ask some of the representatives from the cities that would like to comment on their stormwater programs. If you guys would like to come up here, please. Come on down. <laughs> So if you could please comment if you have specific ordinances. Well, first of all, introduce yourself, what city you're from, if you have specific information on post-construction ordinances and a connection to the um, Iowa Stormwater Management Manual that you'd like to talk about, or if you have specific policies as well, so. I guess I'll start. I'm Kevin Trom with Shive Hattery, but I'm also the city engineer in North Liberty. Um, what I'd like to talk about is our post-construction stormwater runoff control ordinance. Uh, this is managed through the building department, and we have our code official in the back, Tom Palmer, and Bill Miners with us today. Sure, sorry. Um, we adopted this new ordinance uh, close to the same time that we adopted SUDAS, so it's been relatively new for us the last three to five years. And we had been using the old joint municipal design standards, which covered stormwater management. So this replaced that. Um, I highlighted some things from our ordinance that I'd like to go over. Uh, the applicability, it's for any land disturbing activity greater than an acre. And we do have some exemptions, agricultural activity, or single family home modifications. Um, we use the uh, Iowa Stormwater Management Manual as our guiding document, our reference manual, but we wanted to make sure that we had specific requirements in our ordinance. So we defined our channel protection storage volume, <coughs> excuse me, our overbank flood protection volume, our wet detention ponds, because we wanted some additional features in our wet detention ponds that we could um, require. Like for example, we want them 10 feet deep for at least 25% of the surface area. That's one example. We define the water quality volume, and then um, we have a process for all the requirements that have to be submitted to the city. It has to be prepared by a licensed professional engineer. Um, of course, scaled maps, um, all the hydrologic and hydraulic design calculations. Um, a maintenance and repair plan. That's something that we felt pretty strongly about because a lot of these BMPs, the city doesn't take over and they're left to homeowners associations or a commercial subdivision association. And they really don't know how to maintain these, so we wanted to make sure we had a maintenance plan in place that is agreed to by the developer and the city and then recorded as a recorded document. And I think that's worked pretty well. Uh, a lot of times in the old days, homeowners association would take over a pond that they would have no idea how to take care of it. So at least this gives them a heads up of what they're in for and some basic requirements that they have to do to maintain it. Um, and then we 
we have uh, another chapter here or, or paragraph called compliance required and that's where we really spell out that you have to do this this and this and this and this and then you've complied so number one is it treats the water quality volume it provides channel protection storage volume and extended detention it provides overbank flood protection provides an emergency overflow spillway and provides a stormwater BMP facility which are constructed and function in according with approved design. With that, we also require that the applicant provide an as-built uh, plan, all dimensions surveyed, and also certified by the engineer who designed it, and we will require that before we accept the improvements. Um, that I think is also pretty important to have that from the actual designer who's actually seen it and knows that it works generally to their design and then we keep that on file and it has the surveyed um, grading contractors they can change things a little bit here and there but we we want to make sure we have the exact elevations on all the your outfall structures and all the grading um, maintenance and repair of stormwater BMPs so I mentioned that earlier, we have a, a, we call it a BMP maintenance agreement, and it outlines all the obligations of the owner of the BMP. Um, also, we have a provision if the, if the party fails to maintain the BMP, what the city can do. Basically, we have in our ordinance that we come and inspect these periodically it's kind of left up to the city when they when they inspect these and I think we were looking at possibly changing that and doing annual inspections or maybe biannual inspections but for now it's kind of a as needed basis and allows us to access the site at any time um, but it also includes provisions for what happens if a owner does not take care of their BMP what the city can do to them I won't go into all those details, but there are remedies. And we also go over appeals. The Tree and Stormwater Board handles all any appeals necessary. So that, in a nutshell, is our ordinance. It's available on the city's website. Um, and I'll take any questions if anyone has any specific questions about it. OK, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very much. All right. Um, Next, we have the city of Iowa City. Hi, I'm Julie Tallman. I work for the building department at the city of Iowa City. Iowa City, um, our enforcement and administration of our stormwater regulations is divided up between the public works department and the building department. So I'm just going to speak about um, uh, administering these um, stormwater regulations on building sites and I would have to say that um, since the uh, adoption of the topsoil retention requirement that's probably posed the greatest challenge to us as far as knowing how to um, apply and enforce those regulations so um, I will say that from the beginning <clears throat> um, the first step, well, I exchanged a lot of emails with Joe Griffin, and um, he was very helpful in helping me uh, understand that the, um, the state regulations and the federal regulations don't really tell us how to identify those subdivisions that fall under this topsoil retention requirement. They became effective October 1st, 2012. If any of you have ever tried to do the kind of investigation into when an initial plat was filed when so many subdivisions are a resubdivision of lot seven of you know blah 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 well w one thing that I would tell you if if you're interested in this is um, if you're not sure whether or not a subdivision is subject to these top to the topsoil retention requirement I would recommend that you go to your county auditor's website uh, recorder's website, excuse me, and look for the initial plats for individual subdivisions. Um, if a section of a subdivision was platted even as an enormous outlot prior to October 1st, 2012, and then 
yesterday was subdivided into 18 individual lots, it's still not subject to that topsoil requirement because that plat of land was surveyed and filed in a final plat. Um, and, you know, Joe and I talked about, too, is it, is it the preliminary plat? Is it the final plat? Which plat? And he said that, you know, he didn't have real clear guidance on that either, but it made sense to go with the final plat of a subdivision because that's what's recorded in the Johnson County, well, in, speaking for Iowa City, in the Johnson County uh, Recorder's Office. So that's what we tie that topsoil retention requirement to, any lots that are on land that has been final platted and recorded after October 1st, 2012. So um, I have identified the subdivisions. There's four um, that fall within this retention requirement and then the building permits that were issued for um, lots in those subdivisions. And we, frankly, are still trying to figure out how to notify um, individual builders of what our expectations are and how we're going to ensure that they've main, retained the original topsoil that was present before development. Um, one of the regulations that I was able to find uh, talked about, um, let me see if I can, if I can find it here, that um, if a contractor claims that, <clears throat> excuse me, if a developer says, we didn't have four inches of topsoil on our land, that has to be somehow quantified. And it, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it appears that one of the best methods of quantifying that would be to look at uh, the initial stormwater pollution prevention plan um, that was perhaps written for the installation of public utilities, streets, sewers, that kind of thing. and add it as a note, thank you, Carol, <laughs> add that as a notation on that initial Schwepp. And then as smaller individual Schweppes are developed for individual building lots, you know, we can make reference back to that, that larger plan of development. Um, in the absence of that certification, we're gonna have to go out, we haven't purchased a soil probe yet, but, um, and, assess whether or not uh, topsoil was brought in or, re you know, retained or brought in from elsewhere after the home is constructed. Um, so I can't really give you much more than that because, like I said, we're still kind of struggling um, with how to implement this. And it, part of the delay, uh, I believe, has been because we've kind of been waiting for, for guidance and there's been so much... Um, you know, people contesting the topsoil retention rule and um, the latest uh, advisory board to the Environmental Commission. Um, I will say, though, that based on what I've read, I don't think there's any doubt that the topsoil retention requirement is going to stay. What the, the language that to me is the most interesting is, is, is even in the federal regs, it says we're feasible unless impractical or impossible. Well, we can't adopt anything less than what the federal regs say. So whether it's four inches or two inches or whatever, I think, I think that we're going to be looking at a reten topsoil retention requirement no matter what happens in these debates about language. So, um, <clears throat> and that's all I've got. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Okay, next we have the city of Coralville, and they're going to talk about the, their post-construction ordinance that has been recent, was recently passed in 2014. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Amy Foster. I'm with the city of Coralville. I'm in the engineering department, and I'm just going to talk quickly about um, our post-construction program kind of in general. Um, uh, in the spring of 2014, Coralville passed a post-construction ordinance. Um, I'm going to briefly go over these requirements. The ordin ordinance is on the website, so if you want to look more in depth, you can take a look that way. But um, some of the requirements are uh, uh, for new or redevelopment, you must infiltrate the inch and a quarter rainfall event. You must manage the channel protection volume on the site, either through your infiltration practices or through extended detention. 
Um, you must provide safe, non-erosive passage of the 100-year storm. So even when the water leaves your site, you have to be able to um, plan how that water is either getting to the larger, larger regional detention basin or um, through the storm system. Um, topsoil must stay on site, so that kind of bypasses the DNR's topsoil rule. Um, wherever that lands, um, through the city's ordinance, you must keep all topsoil on site. Uh, buffers must be provided on site if a stream is present. Um, and there's some different, um, uh, I guess, requirements based on if you're commercial, residential, industrial, how, long, how large that buffer needs to be. Um, and then, of course, we have the traditional um, detention requirements for the 100-year storm. Um, we also have a stormwater cost share program. And uh, next year, we hope to have the cost share fund, uh, program funded at $30,000 for um, fiscal year 16. Uh, in the previous year, uh, fiscal year uh, 15, we had 25,000. So we've been, hopefully we'll be able to up that a little bit. Um, the cost share program covers infiltration-based practices for unregulated sites. So it wouldn't cover a, a new development or redevelopment that was subject to our post-construction um, ordinance, but it would cover residential or uh, if a business wanted to do something that they were already existing within the community. And it's a 50-50 cost share, so um, the owner pays 50%, Coralville pays 50%, up to $2,000 back to um, the owner of the property. Um, and we're, we're really glad to have these design sheets. Uh, the design sheets will be required for um, design submittals, either through our subdivision review process or uh, plan review process, and then also for our cost share review process. Um, and um, right now, I think Pat mentioned before that we do not have design sheets for soil quality restoration um, or green roofs, but we hope to have those in the next uh, year or so maybe, Pat? A couple, couple of months. Okay, so that's where we're at with our post-construction program. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay. Thank you. And next we have the University of Iowa. Down notes really quick. Um, my presentation should take about five seconds because the University of Iowa is a little bit different than the cities. Uh, we don't have an ordinance or anything like that. Um, our, our designs are based on uh, a standard operating procedure and designs and specifications, and they have very specific requirements in them for our projects, um, mainly that any new building has to meet the one and quarter inch water quality volume, um, preferably using infiltration practice. And as we all know, there's all sorts of those. There's sometimes site constraints that we can't do anything on the site for infiltration and those are we require a, a very large deviation request with very specific language in it saying i i don't know kind of i made sure it was in there let's put it that way so they couldn't get away with not doing anything so um i also serve on the i i was stormwater management manual board along with amy as well uh let's see there's other some other things um we own our bmps um because we own our university buildings, so our building landscape services, um, they're the ones who maintain them. Uh, when uh, SWIPs come by the university, they're done by one specific company. They come through me. I approve them, make comments. Same thing with all the post-construction BMPs, the actual BMPs that are on the sites, everything, that all goes through me as well. Um, I usually reach out to the other cities and other people that I know if I have a question, stuff like that. Um, the UI requires six inches of topsoil or amended soil, so we're well beyond the four. And, uh, um, and a lot of our post-construction BMPs are starting to include green roofs, and we specifically use a modular system, um, and that's also in our design specifications. It's one company, um, and that was based off of BLS's um, recommendation and requirement. That way it was unified throughout the entire university so they didn't have to change methods and means for stuff. So um, we're doing also doing a lot of, um, God, what am I trying to say? Um, cisterns up on the roofs or in the penthouses for the green roofs. 
Um, generally, we're not going to water them, but if we have to, we'll do that. So there's a 22, oh, yeah, 2200 gallon tank up in BBDB. So right now, for using for the three green roofs that are on there. So um, like I said, ours is really unique. I don't have to deal with things that the cities have to since I'm the one that says yes or no. So, <laughs> which is, I'm, I'm very lucky. So in that case, but. Okay, yep, thank you. It. Okay, with that, um, we're nearing the end of our program. I was asked to comment on topsoil requirements, and you heard a little bit from Coralville and, and Iowa City. And for those of you that may or may not know, currently there is a four inch topsoil rule. Actually, I call it the three and three quarter, no, three and a quarter inch, because you can include the, the topsoil that's in sod as well. And um, there was a, the E80 stakeholders group that was formed this summer. They met several times. They could not come to an agreement um, on what should happen with the topsoil rules. And the developers went ahead and proposed language that the DNR's EPC commission approved to go to public hearing. There are three public hearings in the state. Um, Joe, can you give me the details on them? They're coming up in, in March. Where are the locations? And do you know the dates? Cedar Rapids, Davenport, Davenport, and Des Moines. And it's all March 20 something, I can't remember which is It's all March. I've got one date here. I think it's the 18th. March 18th, well. Cedar Rapids for certain. March 18th in Cedar Rapids. So that is an opportunity that you as the public can comment on the proposed language that the, the developers have set forth. Um, or you could propose your own language if, if you like, if you, if you want. So that's an opportunity for you. So um, ISWEP, the group that I direct, we have come up with some guidance with, in terms of what is topsoil. Um, if you want information on that, I mean, we, we talk about the A horizon. It has a dark, dark color. It's loose. It's friable. You can't ribbon it out any further than, than two inches. If you want to know what a ribbon is, you take some soil that's moist, not saturated. You rub it between your fingers like a cigar, and then you pinch it between your thumb and your forefingers, and if it breaks off less than an inch, um, I think you're fine. If, if you can ribbon it out more than two inches, you're probably very close to 30% clay, um, which in my mind, is, it'd be hard to convince me that that's topsoil, because usually it's very difficult to work with. It's, it's uh, usually <laughs> B-horizon type, type soil. Um, so there's some general guidance, usually with a pH range of 6 to 8, because I think you'd have a hard time getting C to germinate if it was too acidic or too basic. Normally in this state, you're on the basic side of things anyway. So um, we have that, that guidance that is available. I'll have to wait and see what happens with the topsoil requirements. There are some cities that um, like Coralville, Davenport, the city of Ames, and I'm probably forgetting a few others, and I apologize, that are just saying it doesn't make a difference what happens with the state's topsoil requirement, we're gonna have our own requirement. Um, so be aware of that, and my guess is it's probably gonna vary a little, a little bit. But I've also presented the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual has guidance for soil management and quality restoration. So trying to have that eight inches of healthy profile through tillage and or um, uh, topsoil and compost as well. So that's probably about what I have. If you have any questions on the topsoil requirements? No? Going once? Going twice? Any other questions to anything we presented today? Okay, so I challenge you. This is the year of International Year of Soil, so I want to challenge all of you, and I'm going to do this at the water water conference too, which I should probably promote that too. It's in Ames at the Iowa State Sheman Center, March 2nd and 3rd. We have the City of Portland representative coming. They're going to talk about their 10 years of experience with green streets. I happened to go to a conference this summer. It's just the practices are really awesome. They've got a lot of experience. They're going to talk about their Green Streets program. They have Environmental Stewards program where the public actually maintains some of their practices. They have Green Art where they're trying to incorporate stormwater into, into uh, artsy types of practices. And they have a Green Roof program as well. So that's in March. Um, my challenge to you is take the opportunity this year, this year to take a look at your property 
your land? What can you do to improve the soil quality? What can you do to reduce the runoff from, from your property? If you come to the Iowa Water Conference, I'll make you write it down and we'll hang it up on a tree or something like that. I don't really know. So any questions or comments? So go out there and design some really cool stormwater things. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.